flag of the United States of America, the Republic, nation, Thank you. First item, Mr. Clark. Our next item is student liaison Grant Wozencroft. Despite the rain. And Floyd Cox finishing up their season after their playoff game a few days ago. Leading up to that, the members of the community and students came together to ensure an amazing senior night for the players. The Towners football team and band also had their season this last week. And we defeated Cranston West by the large. In other news, the girls' soccer team is well into the playoffs right now just recently winning their quarterfinal game versus Situa on Saturday. Jordan Brogan and Olivia Williams have been leading the counties in scoring, with Kaylee Davenport as well. The semifinals game will be held on Wednesday at 5 o'clock p.m. at Sheridan. Last Friday, the high school once again held the homecoming dance as part of the conclusion of our homecoming week. Last year, the homecoming dance was canceled due to COVID, so naturally, the students jumped at the opportunity to purchase tickets. There was a lively atmosphere at the dance that had not been felt in a while. Our students were thankful that we were able to experience this. This past October, our school conducted a series of tours. Tours saw over 2,000 guests walk through the building throughout these four days. Full thanks to staff and administration that were involved in making this possible. Recently, the first quarter ended on November 3rd. That means we are now halfway done with the first semester. Parent teacher conferences will be held this quarter, November 17th and on November 18th. Permission to sign up for an in person time to meet the teachers will be released soon. As for the last of the upcoming events that I have to report on, 22nd is scheduled as the next meeting for the school improvement team. The 22nd will also be the date for underclass and staff picture retakes. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Grant. The next item is the consent agenda with communications, correspondence, homeschool requests, and Approval of minutes for the October 12th, 2021 Executive Session School Committee meeting, the October 12th, 2021 Regular School Committee meeting, and the October 11th, 2021 Building Committee meeting. Do we have any questions, discussion, or a motion to accept? If there's no questions or discussion, I move to approve. So, a motion by Mr. Jonas. Do we have a second? I'll second. Second by Mr. Brandle. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Consent agenda is accepted. Next, Thank item. You. Next item is PTO PTA at Black Reports. Oh, that's a question to me still. Um, I just wanted to get some people out of here so they could go to their PTSA and PTA events right now. Um, I do want to just mention about EPLAC. Uh, the last meeting we worked on um, bylaws, uh, changing them, also making it possible to find information faster and easier for parents um, coming into the district or already in the district. So we're working on that and they are also uh, going to be presenting the, the board at the next meeting so that there'll be a new board of people, not just one or two trying to do it, but a couple of them. 
So that's where we are with that. Once again, it's usually the last Wednesday of every month, um, except for this, uh, this month because of Thanksgiving. So please come if you can, principals, teachers, parents, any of the school committee. Anything else? Uh, next item, please. The next item is public comments one, agenda items. And none. Next item is the superintendent's report. Before, um, before we go into this, I know we have a series of presentations. Um, if it's okay with the committee, I, there are two individuals that I'd like to bring up before that. Um, one would be, Ms. Shane. I know you had a discussion item for Chartwell's. And I know Melissa's here with the with an early start. And then there was a request um, from the committee to uh, meet and uh, have questions posed for our physical plant manager. Um, so with those folks still being here, without any objection, I'd like to move them up. We can start with uh, chart work discussion if that suits the committee. So I asked for this back way back. So kind of by now I have a lot of my information. Um, but I just, I, I guess my concern is I just want to make sure that you guys, now that we have lunch for everybody, that we're staffed appropriately so that we have enough people to pass out the food and get the food to the students, um, both at lunchtime and at breakfast. Is there a specific uh, uh, No. Okay. So um, in the district, we are experiencing deficit with staff. Um, all hands on deck from the chef, the secretary, and myself. Our spots out in the field. I don't think there's any place where we, um, you know, we're lacking as far as, you know, doing what needs to be done. I think when we opened up at the beginning of the school year, I think there was a little bit of a struggle with the hybrid model of resources between the classroom and the cafeteria. But I think since then it's, you know, I end up for the most part. Um, is there? No, so back, once again, this was back in September. <laughs> that, so I, so I apologize. Um, I just want to make sure now that we do offer free lunch that we are feeding as many kids as we possibly can and there, that we're not shortchanging any child who may or may not get their food as fast because, you know, lunch lines aren't always that long, but now that we have food that is, you know, free, um, I just want to make sure. And that's why I asked for this. Right now we're in a capacity of about 57% uh, of the district uh, is eating it. Lunchtime and about 30% at breakfast. Okay, that was my next question. So, yeah, I, you, yeah. And just relative to what under previous conditions, what, what numbers were you typically looking um, at? We went back to uh, October 2019, you know, to compare apples to apples. Uh, we were uh, breakfast participation has increased about 452 meals a day, and I attribute that to. Um, Silver Spring, Waddington, and Francis go to free breakfast. And uh, lunch participation, uh, we've seen a slight increase at White Neck, uh, Waddington, and um, everybody else kind of seems close to being flat. Just okay. curious. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? 
Thank you very much. And next, uh, we'll introduce, I guess, officially, uh, Mr. Chris Murphy, who was hired by the district as the physical plant manager uh, for the high school. Uh, the committee had been looking to meet and possibly ask questions. So, good evening, everybody. As Joel said, my name is Chris Murphy. I was hired as a physical plan manager for exclusive management of this high school and no other building within the district. I've had the pleasure of meeting many of you at the tables, uh, but some I have not met, so how do you do? Uh, <laughs> I was here to specifically talk about the custodial maintenance plan that I've been developing over the last seven weeks. Um, and uh, I was going to outline that for you. If you have questions along the way, please feel free to fire away. Chuck, uh, we're good to go with that. Okay. So what we had to do, we have evening staff and a day staff for custodians. Two to uh, three day staff members and seven evening members. So we split the tasks up into evening custodial tasks and day custodial tasks. I've identified 15 specific tasks for things that need to be cleaned on a daily basis by the evening staff and nine specific things that have to be cleaned specifically on a daily basis by the daytime staff. After doing that, we're identifying those areas. We have back in early, late August, along with uh, union leadership, we segmented the building into 80 different sections. Each employee was then allowed to view the detailed sections of the building and by union regulations, by seniority, was permitted to choose the section of the building that they wanted to clean on a regular basis. That process went very well. Um, and we proceeded to assign the areas to specific people. Continue. Uh, we've tweaked the list a little bit here and there, and some taken some things away and given things to other people that made more sense. But we have established uh, basically a checklist for each segmented area of the building, which is or will be given to the custodial staff as a daily assignment. They simply have their checklist. They're still, they're very aware of what they're supposed to do, but they will have this checklist, proceed through it, check off what they have completed by initially the list, and give the list back to me. This list will allow me to apply accountability to each particular member of the custodial staff to make sure that, number one, they're doing what's expected, and if they're not getting to the certain things that they have been assigned, identify that as well. Or be sure the custodian. We have a, a task that is very difficult for these folks to achieve on a daily basis. Uh, again, this list will define those particular areas. Uh, I received input, number one, most importantly, from my custodial staff, what makes sense and what doesn't from their standpoint. I've also talked with a number of teachers and administrators about what they would like to see, particular areas where we may have not been meeting expectations for the last seven or eight weeks. Those areas are also highlighted. And also, on a daily basis, meet with my custodial staff prior to the start of the shifts to highlight things that I may have seen the previous day that needed attention, or conversely, uh, praise them for things that look great. Because I have received certain accolades from teachers and administrators saying, hey, that stairwell looked great because it looked lousy two days ago, or the windows particularly shine, or things of like that. So, the Segmentation, the assigning of areas, the segmentation of the building combined with this checklist is going to be, in my opinion, an effective method to make sure this building deserves the level of attention that it requires. Okay. So that's the general thing. Are you happy to feel any questions at this point? Sure, through the chair. Please. Uh, just a um, couple of easy questions. The, uh, the, your, um, chain of responsibility to Principal Gibbons. How, how does that work in all of this? 
Are you are you responsive, obviously to Principal Givens? Who do you respond to? I respond to Principal Givens. Okay. On a daily basis. If something is wrong inside the walls of the school, I respond to Principal Givens. We have, I would say, daily discussion about things that need attention or matters uh, regarding custodial staff. Now, if there is an overarching area, of course, I'll reach out to Mr. Fiol or Superintendent Crowley if I feel the need is necessary. So, just, a, you know, so just to and just to be clear, right? So, responding is communicating, but I think reporting, as far as you know, the the org chart would be to the superintendent. So, I just want to definitely make that. Okay, I, I understand, and but I I I think it's obvious that that there's got to be a good communication between uh, the two of you, and and. Uh, Considering you got a brand new school here, okay, I imagine your list is going to get longer and longer, okay, when it comes to maintenance down the road. There are certain things that you may not be facing now in maintenance that you may be facing a year, two years from now. So I'm, I'm going to project a little bit and, and say you might, uh, your, your list is going to be changing and growing, I would, uh, I would think. And also, um, I know that there is a punch list that the superintendent has with Mr. Fiola concerning other things that need to be done in the building. Are you involved with those things also? Uh, it's my privilege to be able to add things to that punch list, things that I see that are out of line, that are expected by the building company that's responsible for the school, I bring to the attention of Peregrine, and then they bring it to the attention of the building company. It's a door that's misaligned, or a, uh, a ceiling tile that fell, or, or, or a you know, floor tile that is scarred or marked, something along those lines. Something that's not right with the building, that is not our fault, something that needs to be addressed, I bring it to uh, my associates, my coworkers that work for Paragraph, and then they take to go back for correction. And where I'm going with this, Chairman Montero, is, as you know, is that um, we will be accepting this building from the uh, owner's project manager and our commissioning agent. Do you have an exact date on that? So the answer is no. What you're looking at substantial completion is not for, you know, uh, close to a year on a total project, but um, you have to have substantial completion of the building to get ownership. And we'll get into, I don't want to go too much into the, right. the building, um, report because I know we have folks that also are presenting, but um, we don't own anything until we accept it as as completed, right, to, to Chris's point. So when you look at that punch list uh, that is being monitored, um, it is not until every item is checked off that we, we are now in uh, possession or responsibility of those items. And, so, and I understand that. I'm just yeah. I'm looking out for the city for all Absolutely. of us. Absolutely. Yeah. And and I'll and I'll speak to uh, some other things that the building committee um, is looking at um, to to that point when I when I do the the uh, building project report as well. But I just yeah. Thank you. And that yes. also affects your day to day job too, doesn't it, Chris? Sorry. Exactly. What? Everything on the punch list. Everything that's not done. Oh, certainly. That certainly affects your day to day. Daily concern. It's right. a daily list that I have. Uh, but I think things, noticing things that I think are out of line or not right, and adding them to the punch list. Yes, it's a daily responsibility. And do you have all the equipment that you need to do get the job done? To do to to supervise and manage this building. Do you have all the equipment that you need? Uh, well, if you say tools, like all the people, all the necessary pieces of communication or the ear of this person or that person. Just not people, Chris. I'm talking about equipment also. Custodial supplies. Yeah. Oh, custodial supplies? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. yeah it, there, I have, matter of fact, I have an, an extraordinary arsenal of custodial <laughs> supplies that have been given to me to maintain this building. Like fantastic tools, yes, without a doubt, without a doubt. Okay, so you, thank you very much. I just want to ask that question. Sure. Any other questions for Mr. Murphy? Just asking any other questions. So thank you, Mr. Murphy. And um, again, I'll, I'll get into a little bit more of the, 
uh, maintenance component for the building report, but I, I wanted, one of the things that I wanted Mr. Murphy to hit on was the custodial um, sheets that he is putting together working in conjunction with uh, the union um, so that there's agreement, there's uh, accountability, but there's also opportunity to, as he said, identify. And you know, I know there's been discussion about you know the maintenance plan for the building, um, and you know there's an item on the agenda later for uh, custodial staff, and that's as a result of those discussions with Principal Gibbons, Chris Murphy, uh, and the custodial team, saying, okay, this is where we're at. Let's kind of monitor and and uh, adjust, you know, as we go. So uh, I think it's it'll they'll continue to be working documents, but uh, thank you. Chris, for putting those together. And now we'll go into superintendent's report. Yes, I know it looks like I'm the bad girl in the corner, but because of a close contact um, with someone, that's why I'm sitting here is in, in abundance of precaution until I'm tested tomorrow. So that's why I'm up here. So excuse it. Um, I'm here to talk about the RICAST testing. I have invited the principals here to make a very brief presentation on the RICAST testing. And the reason I have them here is it's required to have a report card tonight in relationship to the testing results. However, last year um, I was not in favor of giving the RICAS testing statewide because of the situation that we were in. I don't think the results are indicative of our students and the progress or lack thereof progress that they state. East Providence had one of the highest rates of distance learners in the state last year. We were averaging between 50 and 52% of our students were distance learning. And we all know that the, the best way, um, the most efficient way to teach is to have the students in front of you, in-person teaching. So having said that, we have our own assessment, which is iReady. And we are taking students where they are and we're bringing them where they should be individually using our own iReady assessment tool. Our teachers and our principals are working very, very hard to accomplish this goal. I have met with the two coaches and I told them not to do a deep dive into these test results. Half the students in East Providence took the RICAS testing. It is not indicative of the district. It is not indicative of the district, those test scores. The entire state of Rhode Island also is experiencing a decline in the test scores. It's not only East Providence that exhibited that decline in the scores. But the teachers, the administration, our coaches are working very hard in using the data from iReady to assess our students. We have been using that for several years. And it's not an easy task. Many of these students were out of school from March to the following June. They didn't come in until this August. That's a long time to be away from a structured environment, a very long time. So we're experiencing some behavior issues, some social emotional issues, as well as some academic issues. But our teachers working with their administrators in their building really deserve a lot of credit for what they are doing for our students in East Providence. So having said that, I have asked the principals just to give you what the test scores were in RICAST this year and positively what they are doing in their building to address the learning losses. So each one of the principals has put together one or two slides uh, that will show you that. The two coaches are going to show you their slides which are district-wide slides. Again, 
I would not put too much emphasis on these um, reports, these test scores. Remember, a test score is only one indication of what a student is doing. And our teachers are the best judges of where those students are and what those students need. And so are our principals. So I would ask that we start that process um, tonight. And um, Bill Black asked me if he could be first, because I think he's on his way to the PC basketball game with his two children. So if we could have Bill Black come up first. Bill? <laughs> Superintendent, I, I want to uh, kind of echo, and I speak for myself, but I leave for the committee and I'll I'll take anyone's objection to that claim but my position as we listen to these scores is exactly what you said I hope that every presenter understands that we want to hear what your challenges are and what you will need from us going forward uh, in no way do I sit here and look to these scores as any representation of the work that you're doing. It's more so uh, a representation of, you know, the, the challenges that have been thrown before you. And, um, you know, let us know what we're starting with and what you need to, to move forward. So please know that. And Mrs. Bouchain, we'll wrap up with you at the end with your statement. Okay. Bill? All right, thank you. So good evening, everyone. Um, Am I using this clicker or are we doing it up top? I see the thumbs up. So I'm uh, talking about Martin Middle School. And here's our data that's up here right now. So starting on top with our ELA results. So looking at 30% of students are not meeting expectations. Our biggest group is right in the middle, partially meeting expectations. And we feel very confident in both groups with the plan that we're going to talk about to really be able to to move that group that's in the middle. And now our, our students that are meeting or exceeding expectations are a little over 20%. Uh, looking at math next, I'll be talking about our math plan a little bit after this. So math results, a little bit worse. Math is a lot tougher for us right now. We're at almost 36% in the red. Our uh, group that is meeting, partially meeting, is around 50, a little less than 52%, and then just above 12% overall for meeting or exceeding expectations. So when we look at that data, we get a sense of where our students are. As Superintendent Crowley said, the iReady data gives us more domains and specific ideas on where we want to attack this. And we're going to talk about that uh, with Dr. Perry after he goes to talk about Riverside after this. One point I do want to bring up that I, I will take pride in at Martin is that 90% number and that 86% number of students that came in to take the test. We were at 50% capacity of students coming in person, but based on the work by our teachers and families to get those students there to take the test, some of those students we did not see since prior to March 13th of 2020 came in a year later just to take the test because we did tell them we did want to see where they're at. We do want this data. We want to look at this going forward because this will help us with cohorts. But not having the data the prior year really makes it tough to look at when we look at when they were in sixth grade to now when they're in eighth grade, not taking in that seventh grade year. Does anybody have any questions on, on the Martin data? I want to you know, expand a little on that. Okay, I'll hand it off to Dr. Perry. Thank you, Mr. Black. I would direct you to the the end, the right-hand side, the meeting or exceeding expectations of each of the results for ELA and math. 27% meeting or exceeding in the ELA section. Um, we feel that, obviously, this is, this is not where we want to be. The students in the yellow, as Bill had pointed out, we had, over the past few years, really been focusing on the kids in the yellow. The, um, Mrs. Crowley mentioned that we have iReady data. We have this program that we've been using for 
five, nearly uh, six years at this point, and we are much better able to target students and their achievement. We found that students who are in what we call the yellow, that's where we're putting our focus prior to our going out in COVID, and we really were seeing some gains there. We are hoping that once we get back on track, using iReady, using our knowledge of what we, where we were, where we want to go, we will be able to use to move many of those yellows. And obviously with that, we'll be the students in the red. And of course, we want to make sure that our blues are higher as well. Moving to the math scores, we are at 12.8% meeting or exceeding expectations. We did not have the same number of, the same success getting the students to come out at Riverside. Uh, having personally reached out to many parents, many just weren't having having their students come in. I uh, give Bill a lot of credit for, for getting the kids in. Uh, to the next slide, here's our plan to address the needs. And this is what we discussed at the last school committee meeting, so much of it will be what you had heard already. We are going to be focusing on this writing program this year. The hope is that, like many other schools in Rhode Island, who have seen success through this writing program, that we will be able to take this, the kids will be able to take the skills that they are learning and apply them directly to the RideCast. Of course, the whole goal of our writing program is not simply to perform better on standardized tests, it's to make kids better writers, better readers, more literate. However, we are training this year with our, um, both our social studies and ELA teachers and the plan is to, over the next two years, to have this robust program that will bring us to the next level in our RICAS scores as well. All right, thank you. And just to talk about our math, I'm a math guy, so I'm going to go through this piece quickly. But we talked about this at the last meeting. We're piloting a variety of, of curriculum resources that we feel will really allow our students to achieve what they need to in math. It's a very rigorous process through Ed reports, and even today in a meeting with Dr. Ferrand and the department heads at both Riverside and Martin Middle School, as well as our consultant, we, we were given really strong accolades by Ed reports. We're very much ahead of the process right now in terms of other districts in Rhode Island. Our teachers have put in a ton of work. Our students are piloting. We're getting student feedback from them on how it's working and attacking different subgroups and different needs, including our MLL and special education students, there's a lot of thought going into this. So I feel very comfortable that this is going to help us attack this issue that you saw on the prior slide for both our middle schools. We're looking for feedback from the students and what we'll do is we'll have a decision within the next couple of months on which curriculum we decide for the middle school. Then we're gonna do a soft rollout. Instead of just starting the school year next year and put a lot of pressure on our staff to start out the year, build those relationships and have a new curriculum, we're going to work that soft rollout this year. So the district has put aside those funds in order to get us started on the math program this year and then be able to start that ready to roll uh, starting in next year when our students are in uh, September of 2022. So just to reiterate the, the data that we have up there, we absolutely own that data. I agree with a lot of things that were said about that. However, those are our students and we do feel very confident that we have a plan to attack this and show growth with our students over the next year with this plan. Anybody have any questions for either Rob or I on this? I will let you know that just this week we hired two math teachers for the high school that we've been looking for since August, and we lost one at Riverside. So we take two steps forward and one step back. So they've done a great job. Thank you so much, and please extend my thanks to the teachers. Just, just one question um, on the on the math, um, which I I think it's great that that soft rollout this year to, and then hit it running next year. So with those that are in eighth this year going into ninth, how does, I mean, I, just you know, and and if you don't, you don't have to have an answer today, but. Tell you where we're at with that process. So we have already had meetings with the department head, Principal Gibbons, at the high school with our department heads and our consultant, just to go over where we are in the process because they will be following that same process next year. Uh, same thing's kind of been done with elementary from previous year, just to get us on alignment K to twelve. Perfect. Thank you.
And Mr. Montero, that's the state approved curriculum that the elementary went through last year, middle schools going through this year, the ed reports and high school next year. Ed, I just have uh, one more question. Um, how often are students uh, asked to give some feedback to the teachers on the curriculums for, like, for math, for example? So, so it's pretty much ongoing. So daily as lessons are being presented, um, teachers are asking students how it's going. They're having conversations about how they scored. Um, we have rubrics that also that students, that teachers and students complete in terms of getting an understanding of how things are going. Um, I can tell you that the students feel pretty empowered to be able to try this out and know that they have a piece in this because the teachers have been very transparent about that throughout the whole process. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and I just had one question. Um, what are the particular variables that you guys weigh when determining what the curriculum resources are going to be that you choose? In terms of making a decision for which one we choose? Yes. Yeah. So that, that's where we're at right now. So with the, we've got some, um, from some partners. So the nice part of being part of Ed Reports is that all the districts have gone through this process. So uh, for example, we've uh, received a rubric from North Providence. Uh, one of the districts similar to us that has used a rubric that uh, they liked. We've tweaked it. Our department heads and teachers have given feedback on that rubric in terms of making a decision. Uh, once we get in the room and look at it, we'll see how that goes. I imagine we're going to have some pretty passionate discussions one way or another on what works and doesn't work, but we do have a plan in professional development to kind of work through that to make that decision. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Go Thank PC. You. <laughs> All right, I'm going to invite our two elementary coaches, Kelly Basie and Crystal Montero, up to start off with the elementary scores and what is happening district-wide. Uh, so Kelly and Crystal. Hi, I'm Kelly Basie. I was here last month. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm here to present the scores for ELA. And this is going to be for the whole district. This is not just elementary. So, so if you look at the top half of the black line, I just want to explain a few things. Um, as the middle school principals just talked about, anything in red um, are the students that are the percentage of students not meeting the expectations. The yellow are our students that are partially meeting, and the green students are meeting, and the blue students are exceeding the expectations. So it's a few things that I do want to point out. The top half of the black line are students um, in grades three through eight, and those are from the year, uh, I call it pre-COVID year, 2018-2019. And then if you look below the line, we have third grade again through eighth grade, but you'll notice a few things that might need a little explaining. The blue arrows next to those numbers, um, the first one being 305, shows that the number of students that took the test went down. And obviously you can tell in all grades from three through eight, all the numbers went down. If you did the math, um, you know, I'm not a math person, the major, uh, basically most grades went down between 20 and 25% on the number of students that actually took the test in 2020 and 21. Also, you'll notice there are some triangles. That indicates any grade that did not have 85% take the test. And according to RIDE, if you don't have 85% um, take the test, it is not um, as valid, obviously. So we did have four out of our seven grades that didn't even um, have 85% students taking the test. So I just, I'm just i not going to go through the numbers with you. They're there. Um, again, like Superintendent Crawley said, we have our data that we, from 2018 and 19, we used to do a very big deep dive and go through all of the um, answers, the writing, the reading, see where we were successful and where we were not. We are not going to do that this year with the results from last year's um, broadcast. We don't feel that that is as beneficial as to just looking at where our students are and other aspects and moving forward in some of the ways that we talked about last month when we were here. 
So this is just the ELA. Any questions? So basically everything that Kelly just said um, applies to math as well. So when you look at those, the numbers, you'll notice that there are the four categories in which Kelly, you know, described your top half is your 2018-19, your bottom half is currently um, significant decrease in numbers uh, based upon what you see with those blue triangles in every grade level. Um, and then you have four grade levels who uh, were below that 85 percent. And Ryan definitely discouraged any type of comparison because there were so many students who did not take the assessment. And as Kelly said, um, we have a plan in place. We've always had a plan in place, uh, working closely with principals, closely with teachers to do the work we do, um, and we're going to continue to do that. So basically what you have before you is, is, is what one data point um, based upon the conditions in which we questions for me. Any questions? Okay, so our, co our coaches work very closely with our principals in the elementary school and then with the teachers in looking at the data and seeing where our gaps are and how we can improve in those areas. So they work very closely with each one of our elementary principals and the teachers at the various schools. So again, I'd like to thank Kelly and Crystal for the work that they put into that. Um, th they do a wonderful job. All right, the next school, Lisa Peter, I think you're going to report on Orlo and White Neck. Good evening. Ben, Am I waiting for the presentation to come up? Ben Ullo and White Neck. Does he have your slides, Lisa? He does. Is in a different order? Where did, oh, you just passed White Neck. Okay. White Neck first and then Orlo. Okay, good evening. I am presenting tonight on behalf of Lori Marshall on the White Neck Elementary School scores. I'll start with your ELA results. She had 81% of her students in grades three, four, and five take the RICAS assessment in the area of ELA. She has a proficiency rate of 23.4% um, in ELA. As you'll see, which I think is going to be fairly consistent amongst many of the schools, the majority of her students fall into that partially proficient category in that yellow category. And she has 21% of her students currently falling into that red category of uh, not meeting her expectations. The math results are fairly similar. You'll see a large cohort there in that yellow. 44% of the students are nearly meeting. She has 45% of her students are not meeting expectations and 10% of students are meeting or exceeding, which is that little blue bar there, expectations. And again, she had 81% of her students um, took the math assessment. All right, Orlo. The Orlo results uh, will be fairly similar. So again, in both ELA and math, we have a good majority of our students who fall in that yellow category, um, which has been typical for us. Uh, that yellow category is larger this year, of course, um, given our situation, but, but the trend is the same. In ELA, we have 37.6% of our students are meeting or exceeding expectations. We have 16% of our students who did not meet expectations and 46% who fell into that yellow category. We had 92% of our students participate in the ELA assessment. We had 88% of our students fall in, uh, complete the math assessment. And again, the, the pattern is the same. 50% of our students are falling into that nearly meet category. 31% did not meet. And we have um, meeting or exceeding. We had 17% of our students meet or exceed in the area of math. Are there any questions I can answer? Great, thank you. Thank you. All right. Karen Moore. Karen. 
Waddington Elementary. Good evening, everyone. Here are our Waddington scores for the 2020-2021 school year. For ELA, we had 77.7% .7 of our students in grades three through five participate in RICAP testing. Of those students, 12.3 did not meet expectations. 48.2 partially met. 38.5 met our expectations. And 1% exceeded. We didn't fare as well in mathematics. We had a little bit more participation. 78.1 of Waddington students participated. 33.7 did not meet expectations. 45.9 partially met. 18.9 met, and 1.5 exceeded. Any questions? Keep in, keep in mind, the new ELA was rolling out, and March 13th ended that rollout of the new ELA curriculum. Last year, we were rolling out, they were studying the math curriculum um, at the ed reports. And so this year, that new math curriculum is being rolled out. So please understand that they are, um, they were behind with the ELA. As I said, in March, everything stopped. And the math just began uh, this year. So that's what they are doing in looking at their test scores, all of the elementary schools. All right, Silver Spring, Fatima. Hi, good evening. Cool. So similar to the other schools, except um, we did have a decent participation rate of 91.2% of our students in grades three to five participate in um, the right pass testing, with about half of them being distance learners. And so we had, um, it's easier for me to look at my notes here, we had 15.4% who did not meet expectations in ELA. We had a big chunk in the partially met, 51.9%, the 28.8% met, and 3.8% exceeded, which I like to look at the positive where nearly 85% of our students um, nearly or met or exceeded in ELA. So that, I think that's pretty good because we do, as, other, um, as Bill mentioned and Dr. Berry and other principals will mention, we do focus a lot on the yellow, which is the nearly met, help those students and all of the students as well. In the math, we had 35.6% um, um, who did not meet, 48.1% partially met, 11.5% met, 4.8% exceeded, which gave us approximately 64% of our students either nearly met, met or exceeded expectations with the 91.2% um, coming in to take the test. Um, I just want to say that 50% um, of, or more than 50% of our students were distance learners. And um, as our leader here said, you know, it was a struggle for some of them to come in and take the test. But I think that considering all that, and also um, Superintendent Crowley, not only did were we rolling out our ELA last year, but we had a partial day, so we were not in a full day, which meant that we weren't able to roll out the ELA with fidelity because we had to cut our days short. So I think that's something we need to take into consideration. Good point. Good point. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next, Kent Heights, Lloyd Ann Letty. Good evening, everyone. So, Kent Heights had a total of 112 students tested um, in ELA, accounting for 84.8% of students. And the results before you are 35.7% of students were considered to be meeting expectations. 48.2% of students were partially meeting expectations, which has um, been said previously that 
typically at Kent White School, there is a large cohort of students who partially meet expectations traditionally. And last on ELA, 16.1% um, of students uh, were considered not meeting expectations as shown in red. For math, we had the same number of students complete RICAF, 112, which gave us the same percentage of 84.8%. Of that, 17.9% of students were considered meeting expectations by RICAF. 54.5% were considered partially meeting expectations. And then lastly, in math, 27.7% of students were considered not meeting expectations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and next, Anne Marie Scott, Myron J. Francis. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Francis School has a little to celebrate. Um, definitely, like my uh, my colleagues have said, there was some decrease in some of our performance. Our students tested. We had 81.7 percent tested. Our meeting or exceeding expectations for ELA was 64 percent. Our meeting or exceeding for math was 50.9%, um, and we definitely, you know, we still have some work to do in our yellow group of students, our nearly meeting, and our red students. We need to bring those up. Um, however, there is um, some uh, celebration in the fact that we had actually, in um, our all three areas of ELA, our students went up this year, um, and in math, we had one cohort of students go up, um, two had gone down. So, um, you know, it was a really trying year, and I give a huge shout out to all the teachers and students um, that trudged through this year and gave um, their all because it was really a most trying year. Any questions? Any questions? So that completes our elementary uh, presentation. I would like to thank all of the principals. The last 18 months have been like no other 18 months that I've seen in my career. And I give a lot of credit to our principals. Our elementary principals meet regularly with each other and collaborate and they share what's good in one school with what might work in another school they share with each other. They are a marvelous administrative team and I know they're overworked. You know, every day we hope that we have the staff to open the school at this point in time. And they're really troopers. I really appreciate what they're doing under um, some very adverse conditions. They've done a wonderful job for our children and so have our teachers who have also chipped in with this very, very difficult period in education. Um, Jessica, would you like to read your statement? So anybody who knows me, or pretty much <clears throat> most of us who've been sitting up here, I do not need to rely on test scores to decide what our district mm -hmm. is doing. I do understand the importance of it. But when I did find that this was going to come up on our agenda, I did ask that it not be done this way. So I am going to read you what I sent the chair, Ms. Uh, Joel and the superintendent, not to discredit anybody here, but to show that I do think everything needs to be celebrated. Um, we made it through a pandemic year. We did the best we could. We taught students. And to that, I think needs to be celebrated. So on that note, I do not believe that state testing needs to be discuss a discussion with individual principal participation this year. In my opinion, I think we should be sent the test scores, and if we have questions and concerns, then we can go to administration for the answers. I trust that these scores cannot possibly represent our students in East Providence. 
Standardized tests are an important piece of data, but even outside of a pandemic year, it does not tell us the full story. I understand it's really the only data policymakers and people at the state level have, and it is important, but it's not an end-all be-all, and especially not this year. We just aren't in a typical year, we weren't for the last two, and we won't probably be for the next two. It's gonna take a few years to bounce back from the learning loss. I don't need our teachers and our principals to feel like they're defeated, especially when we have come so far and we are completely on the right path to success. With that being said, we have changed how we do almost everything since COVID-19. Why do we continue to have the same operating school committee meeting presentations? When in my opinion, this does not show where we truly are and where our successes are and where we have many ahead of us. This school being one of them that we're in right now. So in my opinion, I did not want this. I did not ask for it. I don't think you needed to present this to us. I read it online just like anybody else here could have. I thank you for your time though. I thank you for your hard work. And if you need anything from us, please feel free to reach out. Through the chair. I uh, want to just take a, a moment to uh, to say what I've I have said before that we are blessed to have uh, uh, some of the best professionals in education in in the state of Rhode Island uh, in the city, and I, I always take pride in the teachers and the people who make up this East Providence School Department, and uh, I, I think looking at these numbers doesn't hurt us. You know, we're strong and we, we see strengths and we see weaknesses. And that's what, that's what assessments are all about. That's why you make assessments, so you can, you can make, adjust your plans. But I, I do want to add uh, the, the principals, the teachers, all of the professionals in the school department, I'm, I'm so very proud of. Thank you for doing uh, what you do. And um, just, I want to yield a minute to Principal Scott. I think you're, you're, you'd like to say something, I think. You're all set. Okay, I thought you, you were making that move, but no, I, I do want to thank the uh, the professionals in this city and uh, thank you for everything that you do and all the hard work, and especially in this in the, these very trying times of pandemic. Thank you. All right, um, I I just want to reiterate that I'm required to do a report card night, so we had to present these scores publicly. So. That has to be understood as well. But I think we did an excellent job, and what we're going to concentrate on is the positive and moving forward with all the positive initiatives that we have going in the district. So thank you very, very much. And next on the agenda is uh, the high school. The SAT scores, naturally, they were taken last year uh, as well. And I think Mr. Gibbons is, wants to talk a little bit about that and he's talking about the initiatives that are going on in East Providence High School. So, Principal Gibbons. Thank you very much. I'm sure I speak for all the principals, and I want to thank the school committee for their support of all of us throughout the past year, and as well as the assistant superintendent and the superintendent. Uh, we couldn't do what we do without the support that we feel, and I just hope I speak for them. And I'm sure I do when I say that we all thank you all as well. Um, thank you for having us here today. One of the things that we're going to talk about with our SAT and PSAT data is our SAT data reflects our 11th grade and the PSAT. Now it's important to note, do I do this? Thanks. Um, our participation rate at the high school for our 11th graders is at 85%, like everybody else in the district. Uh, we were at about 50% in-person students. So to get our high schoolers in was very important. Our, Evidence-based uh, reading and writing scores were 47% that met or approached the benchmark. Similarly, uh, not similarly, once again, our math scores um, are at 23% that met or approached the ben benchmark. One of the things to note as we look through these scores is that our scores for both PSAT and SAT scores from years prior were pretty stagnant. There wasn't uh, a drop at the high school at this point, which is um, a testament to uh, the work the students are doing in, in the curriculum that are, is going on in the teaching in our class. Our PSAT scores 
reflect the ninth grade. In our ninth graders, we had 40% of the students actually in school. It was our biggest, um, biggest group of students who were distance learning and 60%. Uh, and we had 77% participation rate. Fine percentage of our uh, meeting the benchmark and approaching the benchmark was 58% for evidence-based reading and writing. And in our math scores were actually um, a little bit higher. It's probably a user error on my part, I apologize. Um, was at 37%. Uh, one of the things that we'll see, so our, our 10th grade numbers are higher than our 11th grade numbers because the test, they change the benchmark as they get older. Um, so that the scores, uh, you have to do better, markedly better each year in order to see improvement. Something that we know we're looking at addressing. And one of the things that we're doing at the high school, just I want to talk about some of our opening initiatives. Um, one of the things that's really important is, is that we are starting in a brand new building. Uh, we all know that. It's an unbelievable celebration of the city. Um, but the subtleties and nuance of the building for something that we all had to adjust to. Um, everything's done a little bit different from how we walk into the school to how we get to lunch to how we walk through the hallways to our pattern travel patterns. Um, it was all an adjustment that I really um, want to thank all the faculty and staff and even the students. They've done such an amazing job. We've had additions to our programming over the summer as well. Uh, one of the additions in our, in our career and tech center is our allied health program expanded. Um, instead of a singular pathway, we now have three. Um, and students can take more than one certificate if they want, depending on the course they take. We have added a dental assistant um, uh, certification as well as uh, we've had our certified nurse assistants and we've added uh, an emergency medical technician. Within the building, we also made a big investment, which is, is amazing, um, with our state-of-the-art classrooms and spaces that we currently have, uh, and it replicates the workplace of the future. Um, we are also exploring right now with uh, Mr. Hanlon, um, he's going in and really looking at uh, partnerships with local colleges and healthcare facilities to offer college credit and clinical experience. Another one of the additions with the new structure is our addition of a bank. Um, we are working with our social studies department uh, and working with a curriculum in our financial literacy and our, and our economics classes. As well as a partnership we've created and we're continuing to form with Navigant Credit Union um, where we had actually a meeting today with, with Navigant, as well as student input, and um, uh, Mr. S uh, Michael Silva and uh, Mr. Nick Shattuck. We were all in there discussing how we can integrate Navigant into our classrooms and have the representatives and then help our students um, look at financial literacy and learn more about it. Uh, we're in the process of developing a financial pathway um, for our students so that we can be prepared for the college and, and career opportunities in the field of finance. And last but not least, we're, we're soon to have a functional ATM in the machine. I mean, a big ATM machine in the school. Um, and this will help, help assist a lot of different programs in, in teaching students how to make withdrawals, to make deposits, and faculty and staff members as members of our uh, community as well. One of the other things that we've instituted this year, which was a great support of the school committee um, and our superintendent was our WIN block. Um, and WIN stands for what I need. And this new initiative is not just for the students, it's also for our teachers. Everything is new about it. And one of the reasons that we really went into the WIN block, which is something that the school committee and the, the town really accepted, is it was a direct result of the information and data we got um, that we got funded through the XUR grant. But it was focused from information that we got from our student uh, survey works as well as our NIAS self-reflection and visit. Um, what really became evident is we would need our students to have more time to make decisions about how they engage in their school day. We know that if students have engagement in their school day, they have choices in what to explore and how to use that day, that they're happier, and therefore they're going to be more successful. How do we, try to impl how do we implement this throughout the school year? Um, right now, it's happening on white days. We have three days. In a five-day week, we go red, white, all day, and then red, white. We have three different spell schedules. Uh, in the first quarter, it happened during third period of the day, which also aligns with lunch. 
Um, what we did, we set up each different, we had broke it up into four different wind blocks, and each grade had its own lunch. Therefore, we could do grade-specific activities with Zella, which we're going to talk about in a little detail a little bit later. But the example of our 11th graders, they had the first lunch, and then they went to their advisory, and then they had wins three and wins four. What does wind look like going forward with the rest of the year when it rotates out of lunch period? It works this way. Um, on every wind, wet, white day again, but we have two advisory periods. I'm sorry, we'll have an advisory every two weeks to help foster the advisory relationship with our students. As well, students will choose the wind blocks over the next two weeks during that period. What does that look like in particular? This actually has started today, in which case, Today, you can see a two-week schedule if you read across the top. We have an advisory during our first win. And then what the students were asked to do starting yesterday, when they had the opportunity to go into enriching students, is they could choose the next seven win blocks. So they had win two on that Tuesday, uh, November 9th, two on Friday, November 12th, and then continuing into next week on November 16th and 19th. So our advisory and our teachers all worked with our students uh, and helped them choose from the playlist of events that teachers have created for them or that students have said they wanted to do. So what we have done to get this up and running is we've had to acclimate the entire to the whole new schedule and the entire school had to learn how to use enriching students. Our staff had to figure out what they wanted to offer during those times and they've done that in an amazing fashion. Um, our teachers and students have to get ready to be trained how to use it, how to log on to enriching students, because we use that also to take attendance. And finally, like I said earlier, I alluded to the teachers and staff have set up different activities and club meetings and help sessions on a rotation to allow all students to have choices. In that choice, also one of the times that we've used, oh, sorry, different choices that we have um, are set up here, but one of the things that's really important is it's also an enrichment or a time for students to get extra help, or academic support. So a teacher can go in prior to uh, the following two-week interval, and if a student's struggling in a class or getting a grade below 70, the teacher, the expectation for the teacher is that they're going to pull that student during the school day so the, te the student is getting highly qualified instructional help during the school day. We've also used that time for our counselors to facilitate college and career readiness activities for students, such as Upward Bound, such as uh, CTR college advisors coming in, different activities. Students can select from activities to participate in what they need. We have different clubs happening during the day right now. We have an open gym with different activities, which is bad. We have different quiet study areas. We have group study. We have club meetings. This is in addition to the meetings they have after school. It's a way to get new students engaged in the clubs, as well as we're doing a AP and SAT prep and a lot of SEL activities. All these options are supervised by our faculty members throughout the entire day, where attendance is taken and the safety of our students is the prime focus for us all. One of the other important aspects that I alluded to earlier was, was our new development of Zello. It's a four-year personalized program for students through our, our student counseling department. Zello is interactive. Um, Zello also helps students create an individual, individualized learning plan, and it's used for them to help investigate and discover their learning process. It helps guide them into the different pathways we've developed over the last couple of years in high school, because the students are then understanding for themselves which courses they need in order to get into a specific pathway. So they might, the, the program not only has students input their, their educational choices, but also the grades which then helps guide them into different career paths and helps them understand which electives to take as they move through their four-year career at high school. This is all done in conjunction with their meetings with our guidance counselors, uh, I'm sorry, our student counselor department, and uh, it's done through goal setting, short and long-term goals, post-secondary planning as well as surveys. One of the other important things we're doing this year is to really create capacity in the high school a lot of um, the beginning aspect was trying to make sure that students had choice and voice, and what we really want to do is help promote and grow um, um, faculty committees that will then grow leadership capacities in our staff. 
So what we've done after the, um, after the discussion with our department heads is come up, and the staff, has come up with seven different committees and every single teacher in the school has selected a committee to be on. The committees are up here on, on top of the screen in front of you. Uh, they are community outreach committees, our NEAS committee, which once again, we are in the middle, we're still going through and we have another year and a half before NEAS comes back for us. Our school data committee, our school profile redesign committee, something that's very important for how we are, um, how we are advertised up in the public. Our staff climate and culture committee, as well as our student staff climate and culture committee. And finally, the wind block committee. All of these different committees are things that are active in our school, things that we really hope and need to succeed. And this allows every single faculty member to have voice and to help shape the direction of all of these different um, committees. All of these committees are not run by administration. These are teacher-led and directed. And we are serving as, as um, members of each committee spread out, or we will go whenever they ask us to go for a support, but then they report back to us, and we are there just as, we are like an advisory committee to help them make sure that we're all in the same um, boat, moving in the same direction. So we know that if we can build stronger leadership within our staff, we can build it from within, this high school itself is going to be stronger. So although we started off talking about SAT and PSAT scores, really focused on the fact of different initiatives that we're working on in the high school. Um, these are big initiatives. Wind block, success, is really going to shape and change and grow every one of our students' capacity, as well as Zello and our committee work. We're extremely excited about the initiatives that we're starting. Uh, there's a lot going on, but we have the staff and the administration to really um, listen and make sure these are successful. Any questions? I have a question on uh, the, the teacher committees, which uh, I, I love the, I actually, a lot of that stuff is very encouraging to see. So you said all teachers are on, and I may have missed it, how often do they meet and when? So they're meet, we set up a schedule, and they're meeting um, every three weeks on Wednesdays. So the early really, not, not the early release day, the uh, professional development hour, on those all days, we've scheduled them into um, department meetings, committee meetings, as well as curriculum development meetings. And, and are they balanced in participation numbers? Uh, some are bigger than others. Um, you know, this, uh, student climate is a large one. Uh, staff climate and culture is another large one. But we have enough representation in all of them to make sure that we're getting um, good feedback and what we're, what we're really looking to do in ones that have bigger uh, faculty members is actually create subcommittees with different focuses within that okay? and, and help them really take the ball and run with it and, and really, once again, grow leadership within, within the teaching uh, union and, and the, the group. And one last question. Um, the on the wind blocks, um, is there, um, if it's not happening now, do you see it when you look at like choices for students at um, utilizing the CTC programs as, you know, kind of like I've got an opportunity and I want to go into automotive for this wind, even though I, I'm not in that program, is that? Um, I think what we see, one of the things we have to really be careful of with different programs is um, the safety aspects of some of the programs. Um, the whole first quarter for, for auto and, um, and construction, they're all on OSHA safety. Mm -hmm. So to just open those spaces, we have to really be careful of safety of our students. Yet, maybe in some of the other programs, as a ninth grader, they could get involved in it and want to join it after that. That's, one of the one of the um, focuses that we're hoping to encourage people within. At the same time, we are going to have, as we develop this, we are going to have um, different events such as uh, maybe this one is on changing a tire, or you know, different life skills that kid, that students right. might need that we can offer from our different um, career and tech centers. That's and, and I'll I'll leave 
with that is that's what I'd like to see, not just outside of wind. However it, it falls in is I'd like to see those programs be utilized as electives for, you know, students that maybe, like I said, you know, if, if I am wherever I'm bound post high school, but I want to learn some basic auto mechanics or basic framing to be able to take a semester of that class, um, you, you know, I think well-rounded students and so, okay. Absolutely right. I know that, that Mr. Hanlon and I have had discussions about that. We want to make sure that, you know, where there are spaces, that any student can sign up to take those as long as it's safety. Right. 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 So, um, are, are there students that are in our CPC program that's capped based on the different things that we have set up? But we want to encourage our students to absolutely get in there and participate. Mr. Montero, I met with the leadership team, Mr. Gibbons, um, and also Bob Hanlon, and we talked about the internships getting into that wind block. That is one of um, my goals, and I know it's one of your goals, that the students would be allowed to eventually go out and do internships as we move forward, and we would actually be giving them credit for that. And so the leadership team and the administration was very amenable to that as we move forward. But as Mr. Gibbons said, you know, there are certain standards and criteria that we have to set up for sure. safety and that. But yes, we hope to do that as part of these new programs. And I just want to thank Mr. Gibbons, Mr. Currier, Mr. Hanlon, and the leadership team. They were very responsive to some of my concerns about the wind block. And I think they've done an excellent job of remodeling that block. And uh, they've been working very hard, as I know, as a group. And their input is valued as a leadership team. So I want to thank them uh, very much for their participation in this. And thank you, Mr. Gibbons, Mr. Carrier. And Ms. Furtado is the proud mother of a baby boy, a healthy baby boy. Yeah, so we congratulate Assistant yeah. Principal Lee and Furtado. And Mr. Hanlon, we forgot to mention the breakfast specials of the Culinary Arts Department, which you know. Would you like to just talk to the committee about that, the breakfast sandwiches? Well, well he's on his way up. So, yeah. Can I ask, well, a, real, can I ask a question oh. that Superintendent snuck in before I can? Because I don't want to make any of you guys wait any longer. So is it okay, and I know it's okay, but I, I want, you're really okay, <laughs> if I came in during one of your wind blocks just to walk around and see how this is being done? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, why not? I just don't I, want to I, come I, unannounced. I have, yeah, just, just so, shoot me an email and we'll set it up. Okay, thank you. And one of the things just to talk about in terms of what Superintendent Crowley just said about internships, so our schedule rotates every quarter. Purposely, the department heads, when we built it last year, had um, when the first period of the day on white days in the third quarter and the fourth period on the day in the fourth quarter, therefore enabling students to get out and get internships mm. or come in late after an internship in the morning. That is thoughtful. The department heads really thoughtful in terms of delivering that. Uh, I just have a, some other questions as well. Um, for Navigant, do we know if we're going to um, include like the banking classes and um, student loans on uh, things things of that nature into the existing classes that we have for um, financial literacy, or are we looking into creating a whole other class? Partnerships. We're looking at looking at our curriculum and working together with with uh, Navigant and developing those together. So the pathways are a lot of a lot of the pathways are us defining um, classes that we currently already teach, but actually aligning them. And instead of having them be electives in different departments or electives sequentially in different years, it's, it's presenting to the state saying this is a pathway. We offer these courses for us. Um, and are we, or I should say, are you guys uh, looking into potentially in, including like um, how to fill out like FAFSA forms on there, student loans? That can be very tricky, especially when you may not have parents that have any experience on filling those out. So I'm not sure if uh, the guidance department has um, yep. the ability to also kind of, uh, you know, give a voice on, you know, what needs to be included or updated uh, as things yeah. change. They, they, they definitely do. Like right now, I remember the last school meeting we were talking about a resume. Our seniors currently have a resume. If, if they're following the playlist and the, and the guidance counselors are backing them up on that. 
Um, and what we're doing as well is, yes, those are, those are we have um, best nights. We will have those meetings during when, around the time when students have to apply for the financial aid. We, without a doubt, plan on making sure that we're making everything available during the school day for our students that might not have some of the comfort of an evening or if even they're working. Um, and for the Zello program that you guys, uh, that the um, department uses, is that monitored by the uh, staff as well? Or are they being encouraged to use it throughout the school year or is it just kind of use it, you know, if you feel like a type of program? It's definitely monitored by the school counselors. And the school counselors actually, like I said earlier, if a student's struggling in a class, and a student might not do what they're asked to do during one of the advisory periods for, for uh, like we had a Zello day uh, last Friday, um, which were a couple playlists of assignments for students to do. Those that didn't do it probably got scheduled for guidance this week so they can work on it, in which case they'll show up to guidance and someone will help them go through it step by step. And um, for the other departments, for example, since they're in a new building and I know they're still adjusting and getting used to, you know, the different environment, students, you know, coming back into the classroom for the first time in a while. Um, but are, have you kind of spoken with the different department heads and seeing how they are looking into uh, collaborating with each other in the future, if not yet, because of, again, the environment this year. But are, um, are we encouraging that? Is there a system in place? for a teacher, for example, if they have uh, an idea or a proposal to kind of work with other teachers, for example, uh, is there some sort of process that they can go through to present this and mm -hmm. potentially if everyone's on board to implement it? Absolutely. Um, anytime that there's any uh, activity that a teacher wants to do, they will go to the department head and bring it to the department head. Uh, we have sign-up sheets for the two amphitheaters on the third and fourth floors. Uh, we have sign-up sheets for the collaboration spaces on the third floor. There are 16 on the third floor uh, that are out in the open, as well as we're, we're piloting a lot of these um, checklists to try to make one thing, once again, in the new structure, how do we make it work? Field trips. Okay, they'll, they'll, there's a process which is in place. Just like today, we had uh, two English classes joined in the amphitheater, and they had our media specialists in there to go through how to research. And so those amphitheaters, you know, have those two big things. It was, I should have taken a picture of Twitter today, but I was running around quick looking for somebody. Uh, so I, I should, but it would have been an amazing picture if the spaces are being used as they were intended. Yeah, th that's why I was asking. It's because, you know, we have so many resources now that we haven't had before that I want to make sure that um, not only the teachers are being, you know, supportive, uh, supported and, you know, bringing their, these new ideas, um, you know, up to the department heads and, you know, other uh, colleagues. I also want to make sure that, you know, this building is, you know, you being used to its full potential. Um, and I also want, you know, so, so parents know that, you know, we yeah. not only does it look nice, not, not only is it safe, but it's really uh, conducive for learning and teaching. So that's why I'm asking that. Yeah, we're really learning the building. Uh, but if I said it was perfect right now, I'd be lying to you because we, we are going to figure out how things do things better, right? It's brand new. We're figuring it out. Uh, but the spaces are being used as they were intended. And, uh, and we just know that, you know, as long as we are not complacent, I mean, we're happy. But we know we have to continue to work on tweaking things to make our new school uh, the best high school, not just physically, but the best high school in the state. And that's our goal. Thank you. If I could, uh, through the chair, Mr. Gibbons, this, um, wow, okay, this is great. Uh, I, this is a super presentation, and I'm sure, that I know you did it yourself, but I'm, I'm sure many people are involved with this. This is a great plan. You map everything out. It's easily understood. It's innovative. It's aggressive. And, uh, you know, I, I wish you the best with this, this going forward. It sounds like a lot of it's already in place. It's ambitious and it's positive. And uh, I haven't seen anything like this in a long time. Okay. And I want to thank everybody involved with this because this is a, uh, a super program. It's inclusive. It's aggressive. And, and uh, outside the box, maybe. But uh, it, is a, it is a super presentation. And I wish you the best with it.
Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just so thankful for my leadership team. You know, it's it's not me. I just listen, trying to listen more and more and, and uh, listen to the department heads. I want to thank Deb Wormrad for being here as well today. Um, just to, just in case there's any questions, but um, lucky, lucky, in the support they have from both assistant superintendents and superintendent Crowley is amazing. Thank you. I'd like Mr. Hanlon just to talk about some, he developed a partnership with CCRI and a little bit about um, the breakfast program that is newly established this year and when they're gonna open up the restaurant. Mr. Hanlon has come into this and he's done an excellent job in his first year with trying to put all this together in a very, very short period of time. So Mr. Hanlon, if you would just sort of, and he's very involved in this total plan as well. So Bob. Thank you, Mr. Crowley. Uh, so um, with the, one of the big initiatives, uh, but one of the standards uh, in career and tech education uh, at the state level is that we uh, give work-based learning experience to students uh, as they go through their uh, the time in the program. So uh, a big part of that in many of our programs is school enterprise. So the, um, the culinary arts department, uh, obviously, with COVID and everything, they kind of had to shut down the kitchen. And so we've been gradually working into the space uh, that they have, the new beautiful kitchen that they have upstairs, uh, and, and rolling out a menu. So uh, we started with lunch, basically sandwiches and salads, uh, right the first couple of weeks of the school year, and then we went to breakfast. Uh, and this is on a grab and go basis for teachers. Um, and, and now they just rolled out this week, they're, they're forming the projected like, entrees and teachers to sit down and have lunch uh, in the County Pride Cafe. Uh, we've been making about 350 to 400 bucks a week on that. We're using the money to provide uh, uniforms for the students uh, and other opportunities for the students. Also, uh, as Crowley mentioned, uh, CCRI, I'm actually uh, working with several different organizations uh, to create a partnership to uh, sort of post-secondary credits for um, the uh, Allied Health Programs to have uh, an organization that we partner with probably will be CCRI to come in and teach the EMT program, uh, get students uh, certified EMT by the time they leave here, uh, working with Evergreen on the CNA uh, side of it. And, uh, you know, so just making sure that we uh, use every resource that we have available in this great community to uh, provide kids the best opportunity that they can get. So uh, does anyone have any questions on that and what's happening with the career tech? Mr. Hanlon wrote the Perkins grant. It was his first year here. He did an excellent job with that grant. It's not always easy, so I want to thank him. It's a nice teamwork there at the high school. So he's done an excellent job as an administrator, first year director and administrator. So thank you, Bob, and thanks all the teachers in that department as well. I'm not pushing anything, but I do know other districts are waiting for us to have that open house, you know, I've been contacted, I don't know if you guys, I've been contacted by many in the East Bay area waiting for that date to happen. <laughs> uh, it is, if we do have a, a tentative schedule for it. We mm -hmm. have not uh, started advertising it yet. Okay. But, uh, it's, you don't have to worry about it. We're going to bring the, um, I'm going to present it to middle schools, uh, and then the middle schools are going to come here, and then the open house is going to be later, uh, like the next week after that. So we do, we are in the planning stage for that. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank right. you, and uh, uh, to to you three gentlemen, and and uh, Leanne, as superintendent said, congratulations to her. But um, I, I know you guys are fighting the fight every day. You're 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 herding cats that haven't been um, in a structured environment for a year and a half. So. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. I'm just going to skip to the LEAP initiative. So, Ben, if you could put that PowerPoint up there. That's the last of the PowerPoints. And then I'll hand it over to Dr. Voller for the 504s. Thank you. So, um, this there was a learning equity and accelerated pathway abbreviated LEAP task force report that came out from the Rhode Island Department of Ed in July. And this report encompassed many um, areas of education here in Rhode Island. 
It had um, the root causes of our academic and non-academic data and how to dig deeply into this data. Um, systematic enabling conditions that result in this data. It looked at learning priorities for the state of Rhode Island in strategic planning. It talked about in uh, the serving the needs of the diverse population that they felt Rhode Island really doesn't serve well. And considerations for expanding the learning process and how to govern the expectations of this report. Dr. Ferran, Dr. Bowler, myself, and Craig Enos met with members of the Rhode Island Department of Ed concerning the LEAP District Support Program because it came to my attention that East Providence was one of nine districts that was recommended to take part in this program. We listened to their report and after it, we immediately said, oh my God, we can't do another initiative um, because we're really, you know, the teachers, the administration, everybody is just out flat. However, uh, we decided to call principals together along with all of the directors have ride back in to go over this plan. So if you'd move it to the next section, and this is an overview of the LEAP District Support Plan. What it does, or what Ryan says it is going to do, is to select districts with targeted supports um, for the implementation of this report. To build an infrastructure for district improvement that's sustainable and strategic and align the work across Ride to support selected dis districts, right? Helping selected districts. All right, if you go to the next page, who is involved in the work? East Providence, North Providence, Woonsocket, Pawtucket, Providence, Johnston, West Warwick. I can't remember the eighth one anyway. I Central Falls, okay, Central Falls. And there's one more, I, I think, one more. I thought there was nine. RIDE is involved, these consulting agencies. One is Proving Ground and the other is West End. Next slide. Um, nine districts and what the eligibility rate was based on. Why was East Providence chosen? Well, East Providence happens to be an outlier where the other districts have more commonalities, but somehow we got in there. So it was the COVID-19 health metrics where we were high, how it impacted us. But East Providence, all they went by was zip codes. We have the highest number of nursing homes in the state of Rhode Island as a city. So naturally that number was high for us. So how it was, how it impacted us. Uh, school climate and student well-being, we, they looked at attendance, chronic absenteeism, and survey works climate data. Well, we looked at survey works client data. Uh, Yaniza brought it to our attention, and our climate was, was pretty positive in most of the schools, so we're not quite sure um, where that came from either. The percentage of students from his uh, um, underserved in the various areas such as special ed, MLL, they looked at all of those special needs students. And then the academic performance on RICAS data pre and post pandemic. So going back to 2019. Next page. So there are the districts. Low, oh, I think I forgot one. Oh, Newport. I had forgotten Newport. There are the districts that have been chosen to participate in this they say it's not an initiative, but it is an initiative. So next page. Um, RIDE received about $20 million in federal funding, and this is one of the ways that they want to support districts by applying some of this funding to support the districts in this endeavor. 
So depending on the amount of money that we receive from ESSA 3, uh, they will match a percentage of that. East Providence is $3 million. So if we put up $3 million, they will put up $3 million, give us three more million dollars. Now, when we say we have to put up $3 million, we may already have the $3 million associated with the priorities of this initiative, which would count towards our $3 million. Next page, please. This is all coming from their ESSA 3 funds. The district participation is that there's a, it's a two-year program, an MOA that you have to sign for two years. There's an introductory superintendents institute sessions that I would have to attend. A series of nine proving ground workshops and related communities of practice to support planning and implementation. And then the completion of the work between the sections. Next page. What type of work will districts ask to invest in? Well, you see those initiatives in front of you. Those are the ESSA three requirements. We looked at this at the meeting, and we have money in each one of those particular um, initiatives there. We already have it. We have met with our principals and our directors and we have little stickies in Dr. Bowler's office um, and in my office as well as to our plans for ESSA 3, which we don't have the application yet, we're still waiting for. So um, with the input from district leaders, we have established what we put into our equity, what is expanded learning, instruction, student well-being. So we already have ideas of allocating our ESSA 3 money into what we call the LEAP priority initiatives. Now, what Ride is saying, they will give us another $3 million to put into these initiatives. Next page. Um, this is the commitment page in preparation. It talks about phases one, two, three, and four. Um, it gives the timelines also for this initiative, as you can see. Next page. Next steps. We had to communicate this to our school committee members. Um, the way it came up and was going to happen, um, they didn't even build in to the fact that we really need to talk to our school committees, the superintendents that were involved before you we went ahead with any of this. I have the MOA, which we'd have to sign if we wanted to go into it. Um, there is that Superintendent's Institute and the district meeting to identify the LEAP priorities and initiatives, which we've really already identified for East Providence. And then this is what RIDE is going to do. It's going to schedule an initial meeting with the district and a small team issue a press release to announce this, meet with the district teams to discuss their involvement, the superintendent's institute, and that keeps coming up, and um, whether we'd be on board with this initiative. They've hired three fellows to be our contact to ride. Um, one is from Davies, one is from Coventry, and one is, I believe, from Johnston. Um, teachers in the district that'll be our conduit to the Rhode Island Department of Ed. Next. Next slide. No, is that it? So what are the benefits? It talks about the money being given to the district. It talks about participation in a series of workshops and strategic planning with those two um, Proving Ground and um, West End. The district, whoops, talks about the district support. You just went backwards. 
Um, it talks about the district support. So the governor, the governor wants this to happen. Uh, the governor wants to have a press release. He did have one press release already where he announced the districts that would be able to participate, but he didn't, we asked that he not, not commit us because at that point in time, you know, none of the districts and all of the superintendents have talked about this, had committed to that. There were changes that we suggested in the MOU that had to be signed, and of course, um, it is in our hands of our lawyer, Ben Scunzio. So there's not another thing that I can really ask our teachers to do or our principals to do. It really isn't. So I was back and forth, honestly, with this and whether we should or should not do that. I feel that we have started a lot of the initiatives already and um, I would make the commitment uh, to support it and to attend it. Dr. Bowler is actually doing the ESSA three grant for us, as I spoke to her this afternoon. So that's an important piece with that. Um, and then a small group of um, leaders that would be from central <coughs> administration. I think it's hard to turn away three million in this day and age. I'm not happy about the, neither are the other superintendents, the way this came about, and I'm sure they're probably watching us on television right now, um, without any superintendent support or input into this. I believe they need to do something to show that they are supporting districts in this endeavor. Um, so I'm bringing it forward to you this evening. It's a quick turnaround. It had to come. I think there are eight of nine districts that are meeting tonight to discuss exactly what I'm discussing with you here. I, I'm not going to tell you I don't have reservations, but I have a lot of faith in what we're already doing and the planning that Dr. Ferran is running with our middle schools and that math curriculum that she's participating in, Dr. Bowler and the equity and the writing of the SO2 and the SO3 grant and some of the initiatives and curriculum that she's involved in as well. Um, uh, also, Leslie Anderson was at that meeting to talk about our participation in those subgroups. Uniza Gallant was there and some of the wonderful work that Uniza is doing with our MLL students. So I feel like we have the structure that we need and we are moving in that direction anyway. So any questions? So, if I, if I may, yes. you know, I'm very, very shy to give my opinion. If you could just talk a little louder. I just, I just told him ladies first, because I'm just going to make mine clear. Can we see the MOU that the lawyers have before anything else goes further? Oh, nothing else is going to go further until tonight. Okay. Yeah, so I, but can we yes, see it? Because this is the first yep. time. I, yep. I mean, I'm aware of this because I, I saw the press release on November 2nd. Yep. by the governor. Um, so I definitely would like to see what we're doing before we even discuss this, in my opinion, even tonight. Yeah, no, no I, I think the, you know, that MO, MOA, MO, you know, that needs to be um, before us. I don't have a problem turning down $3 million when there's such a thick string attached to it. Um, in my opinion, when I some of the comments that you made, I agree with 100%, which is why I'm less inclined to get on board. And that is that we have so many initiatives that are being rolled out by our district leadership, both central admin and at the school level, that I feel like this would actually add to people's uh, you know, workload. Um, they're reporting, you know, 
when they say there's three million dollars, yes, but where's it going? It's going, much of it, I could be dead wrong, but much of it I'm going to um, assume is, is going to outside third party resources that are partnered into this program, um, at least a good amount of it. And, you know, the Superintendent's Institute, I'm sure there's someone that's being paid to facilitate that uh, program and to have the superintendent, any superintendent across the state for, for RIDE to come in and say, we're going to pull resources out, you're going to meet with our people coming out of a pandemic. Every administrator should be in their districts supporting their district people day in and day out, not the cynic that I, that I am, not playing a role in someone's political campaign for photo ops and to say, look what I did for students in, in these underserved communities that they absolutely have no connection with. Um, and as far as ride, and I'm not exactly over the moon with the leadership there. I think there's a lack of focus uh, with that individual with the renewed contract and uh, they're out of touch with what districts need anyway in my opinion so the timeline is short i i have to tell you um we're supposed to let them know because they're scheduling a first meeting on that we're not signing anything at this point in time and I can get that to you tomorrow. The M M O U. It would be the same for all nine districts. I'm sorry. The M O U would be the same for all nine districts. Yeah, mm -hmm. with the yeah. two-year commitment, you know, just just fund your districts and stop putting, you know, just nine. attaching things to it. Again, there there's a lot of things going on right now. We just listen to. Um, just about every school leader in the district talk about what's at hand and what they're what they're tackling and this is they're working in their own environments they know the needs of their own environment so to tie into a two-year commitment for someone to come in from the outside and you know basically cash a check from a grant that's funded so that they can come and tell these leaders what they need to do without ever stepping foot in their in their building. This is not the time for no, that, in my opinion. Joel, I couldn't ask any of the principals. I mentioned that. I could not. It would have to come out of central office, really. Yeah, but we, and, 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 and I don't want central office leaving the district. <laughs> There's way too much going on right now. We don't need, uh, we don't need field trips to, to ride. I just don't want you to think that we don't want to do it, and you know, three million was a lot of yeah, money. But it's not, so that's yeah. why but I it's not, if presented it's not, it this way right. tonight. But it's not three million in the general fund. You know, that's that's not three million going into the general fund for our discretion. No, it isn't. Sorry. Is there anyone else? Well, uh, I appreciate you letting us know, but uh, I will definitely look forward to just receiving that in my inbox so I can also read it for myself. So, Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we're going to have Dr. Bola give you some updates on 504s. Uh, there are a lot of questions, and sometimes I know you get emails in regards to these. This is a non-special ed program. I'm just going to give her you have her give you an update on the committee, et cetera. Dr. Bola? Uh, yes, good evening. So first, are there some specific questions that you want answered? Or I don't know if anyone else brought this up, but this recently came up at an EPLAF meeting, and uh, we were discussing, parents were asking about questions about 504s that came up about the principals are in charge of it. Then I was like, oh great, there's another thing they need to worry about now. Um, so I think- That's not new. They no, no, correct. Okay. But everything else is new. Like, you know, with the principal empowerment is all new. So prior to that- Prior to that, they were still running 504. Correct, but they weren't there. running everything else. So I guess what happened is it came up in a conversation. Many people did not know. They actually thought 
going to an EPLAC meeting was the correct place to go to discuss that. So I think that's how this was all brought up. I think it needs to be discussed what the process is for 504. I think we need to figure out where that needs to go on our website so that people can be informed because they're going to the special ed, whether it's in special ed or not in special ed. And ultimately, that's where this discussion, I think, needs to lead. So that's, I found out you. After all these years on this committee, I did so, not know it was you. So I can tell you yeah. why you might know that it's yeah. me because I'll go back to possibly 2017, uh, maybe about a year after I came, there was an um, OCR uh, report that had to be addressed based on the um, CTC, and that was my responsibility. And so one of the recommendations was that on our stationery, we have our discrimination statement, but it did not have who the 504 coordinator. So if you look on a district stationery, it's right there at the bottom. I can tell you for the um, elementary handbooks, it's on the front at the bottom, and I believe that year um, I asked that it be included in all of the handbooks. It may not be on the front cover, it may be on the inside cover, but there's the statement about um, the district's discrimination, then there's my name as the 504 coordinator, and also the, I think it's called the TTY oh, right. number, in case you need um, um, a, a assistance with hearing through the through the phone. So um, the principals are gone, but I will certainly go back and remind them to make sure that that is in their handbooks. It is, in, I review the elementary handbooks, so I know it's there. So um, it is not a special ed plan, it is a regular ed plan, and it's, it's an accommodation plan to ensure that um, students who might have some type of physical or, or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities, may need some support um, and, uh, and support in order to be academically successful or access the learning environment. And so it is, um, a, 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 each, each uh, principal has a 504 team, parents come, it sort of looks like an IEP, but it is not. They're two separate. This is a regular ed intervention inter intervention plan, and it's based on uh, accommodations or modifications. Uh, accom accommodations may be in terms of someone who may need um, some type of support based on self-care or walking or, or, or seeing, and the accommodation helps students learn the material better. So for instance, um, a student may not and, and I, I, I may need an audio book as opposed to being able to read read the book themselves. Um, and then in terms of let me just move my notes up to make sure I cover everything. Um, modification is what the students will learn. So the plan may talk about some type of modification in in, in an assignment. Sometimes we know about. Um, um, modifications because oftentimes when students take tests there's extra time um, for students to have in terms of taking in terms of taking a test so it is a regular plan it's reviewed every year parents come present the information and it is a team decision normally I'm not involved at the school-based level only if there is um, something that causes it to go further than the school-based team but it is not my decision to overturn anything because as I said it is a school it, it's a team based it is a team based um, team based decision um, I'm trying to think what else I can tell you so could we so you mentioned the handbooks I've noticed and I wanted to ask the teachers not today another day our principals I noticed since everything seems to be virtual and everything's on the computer now like even so much so you know the residency requirement or I can come to school because I don't have COVID requirement that I think was supposed to be filled out today, which even myself for my own daughter did not do to yet today because I totally forgot because it wasn't a piece of paper in front of me. Um, a lot of that stuff is online and I, I think a lot of people aren't looking to find where they can all get that unless we are passing those out. And well, So I can yeah. say to you, uh, Jessica, when I went back and reviewed the, um, the elementary handbook, 
yes, that, that statement is there, but when you look through the table of contents, there isn't a specific se section that says 504. So moving forward, we can add some information. Yeah, about can we the add who is on each 504 plan from each school? You mean who is like on the who team? Like who is on the team, yes. Would that be, I know other districts like North Providence does it, Providence does it. I don't um, know if it's I guess possible. if the team stays safe, if yeah. the team stays stable throughout the year. Okay. But again, it would be um, the classroom teacher of the student. It, hopefully it would be the parent. Um, sometimes the, the principal heads the team. Sometimes it may be somebody else that, that heads the team. So if you had a student who, if my student needed a 504, the first place to go would be to the principal to the principal yes and set it all up with them yes okay Thank you. but look for that statement uh, I have one question too sure. um, in the presentation you're about to give do you uh, I can't I'm sorry I I can't hear you can you not hear me because now? of your mic no, but we also I heard have it this for a second. noise behind us okay um, in your uh, presentation, are you going to speak on uh, the behavior intervention plans? Like, do we include that with 504s or no? Um, I'm going to defer to Leslie on that. Um, so sometimes they are, and sometimes they may be separate. Like, specifically with, like, students that may uh, be, like, hyperactive and stuff? Like, I don't know if So there's... It, it all depends on um, what the disability may be so you're asking about adhd yes there are times that there are 504 plans written written for students who who have adhd any other questions <laughs> thank you okay. all right um Next on the agenda, and I meant to uh, mention it when we were talking about the initiatives. You know the distance learning um, plans that I showed you last week that um, RIDE has allowed districts five, you know, distance learning days. Well, you heard all of the elementary people talking about their initiatives, and due to the lack of substitute teachers, um, we're unable to free them up to do any kind of professional development during the day at this point in time, and I think the winter months may get worse. So on December 8th, we'd like to give the K through 8 a distance learning day. So the teachers would come in, they begin the classes, and then they would participate in professional development. Again, the continuation of the ELA and the math initiatives that are going on in both K through 8. Uh, the high school has requested a January 14th distance learning day. They'd like to do all of the PBGR work on that day in the morning and the afternoon. Now last year what we did is we gave them, I believe it was two half days in which to do the PBGR. So on January 14th, we'd like to move one of those distance learning days to a K through 12 distance learning day. And then the K through eight people could concentrate on the professional development of the curriculum. And then the high school would um, do their PBGR reports. So um, that would be helpful. Any questions? All right, next on so, the- Superintendent, so on that, should I assume that we'll be presented with an updated district calendar for yes, approval? Yes, we will. Yeah. Reflect those days. Absolutely, moving the distance learning days. All right, the next on the agenda is the additional night custodian for the high school that Chris Murphy uh, mentioned to you. That would be, um, actually it'll be a district custodian. We won't just specify. Um, that particular person would be on nights right now because Chris has been tracking them and we're seeing that there is a problem with a section that is not getting cleaned on a regular basis. And as we said, this is gonna be fluid, this is gonna be flexible, so I'd like to approve a new position for a custodian. 
Next, and that's on um, a vote for this evening. The next, I'm going to turn over to Diana, which is the transportation report that Mr. Montero had asked for as well. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hello. So, um, do you have specific questions that you wanted to ask, or did you want me to just go through transportation? So, um, I mean, obviously, we had we had uh, issues with as we started out the year, as most districts did. Um, but it's my understanding, following the information, that we did have occasions where uh, the number of buses that were running were not what was scheduled. Um, right. So basically, because of a staff shortage, we did have uh, some buses <clears throat> that needed to be uh, doubled up. Right. So. Um, so the question. Uh, we're not holding back any payments. Uh, what will happen as we did last year um, is we get a credit for the buses that weren't used. Um, that happens with statewide. They give us a credit for uh, the transportation issues as well as for Ocean State. And I've been looking at those days and making a note of the days that we've had some problems. Is that, it? And, and forgive me for not, I, I meant to pull it up beforehand, but is that how our contract is written, written that we're not entitled to a, a reduced invoice and only a credit, or is? I, I'm, I'm not sure, I'd have to, I'd have to defer to uh, Mr. Enos, but at this point in time, it's just, it's an easier, cleaner method than having to reduce, because everything is done in equal amount on an installment basis, so it just makes it easier at the end of the year. But, um, so, and, and then the credit, with, without expecting additional services, expenses, so at the end of the, the fiscal year, do we then receive those i mean I'm, I'm trying to reallocate funds right because if we're if we're not needing those funds for transportation then a credit doesn't allow us to move those monies to another line item where maybe you know maybe it's something that w that we would like to make a one-time investment in since we have some okay so right now um we 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 have not looked at um, the buses that were doubled up, but right now we pay like $443, I believe, and change each day for one bus. So uh, there were three days that one of the buses that provides transportation to uh, parochial schools were not, was not available due to uh, an illness. So at that point in time, we basically saved $1,300. Uh, $1, so is that a flat rate regardless? So you said that was for parochial schools? Right. So basically, we pay, again, forgive me, I, I, I have the old number in my head, not the new number, uh, but I believe it's four forty three sixty eight. that each bus costs us each day to run. Regardless of the number of runs and regardless the, of the number of runs and the destination for the, for AM and PM, the only thing that does come into existence is we're pay, paying a flat fee for the vans that we use, which is somewhere around three hundred dollars, and then we pay for midday runs for the pre K program because we have AM PM and then we have the midday for the afternoon session. Okay. Through the chair. Please. Diane, I, I, uh, I know this is not your personal fault, okay? You don't, it, you, you can only try to manage it. I, I am contacted by uh, parents 
um, on a regular basis that and it indicates to me that if this is a day in day out problem is that correct um, it hasn't been a at the beginning of the year it was okay then it moved into it being a problem it's been somewhat stable now um, and when I say somewhat stable now it's over the last two weeks so but do we have I mean if I could count how many buses or how many drivers we had a problem with being out and it was maybe three or four not 38 plus 15 vans. Three or four a day, a week? Uh... Um, well, unfortunately, it probably was like three or four a week. I would say three or four a week. So it's, it is fluid then? Again, it hasn't, it's been pretty good the last couple of weeks, so I don't want to jinx anything, but it seems like we've only had one or two issues uh, last week and this week I haven't really heard anything do we have sub drivers and that's causing a little bit of an issue yes but right now all of the routes are being covered by all of the buses so as far as you're concerned the job is getting done the job of transporting the students back and forth to school is being done is it being done as smoothly as I would like no, and I think that the the bus driver, uh, the bus company would concur that they would like it to be a little bit more, you know, smooth as well. The problem is when people call out, there's a shortage. You've heard it from Chartwells. You've heard it about our parents. You've heard it about our teachers. Bus drivers were having the same issue. And there's no way of predicting what's going to be a good week or what's going to be a bad week, is there? No, but I have to say that Ocean State has been very, very good with providing um, coverage. Um, statewide has done their best as well, but I'm talking to Nicole Martin. Um, she indicated that I think she had something like 100 runs that weren't covered across the state. So we're in, we're in pretty good shape right now. Oh, that answers my question. Thank you. Do we have, um, and again, I, I, I regret not um, reviewing the contract again before, so I apologize for asking you. Um, any time, you know, when it comes to actually being on time on these routes, is there anything, any language in the contract that has a commitment to on-time delivery? And... If so, is there any, I see Craig giving me a... a yeah, and, and I guess I'm just trying to understand, like when you say time delivered, you're talking about getting the students to school? Correct, yes. Yeah, no, pick, pick up within reason, right? But pick up because I know we had, we had those issues. Um, okay. So we're, mean, we have, we inquire and we expect that they will do it in a timely, safe manner. Uh, there are problems that exist, especially being that the high school, between the high school and the middle school time frame has always been tight. And with the new, the new drop-off pickup, traffic on Pawtucket Avenue has caused it to be even tighter. So that is an issue right now. And that's trickling down to the elementary. And probably the only alternative, or one of the easiest, would be to add buses, but you don't have drivers. And I wouldn't suggest adding buses because um, I'll remind everyone that you know this contract incurred, I think it was about a 19% year over year increase. What was it? 14. 14. Um, but again, so, we're, you know, if we were one of the many that came up for renewal. And right. Well, no, I know. That, yeah, they played the game, which is why, I, you know, I don't have any sympathy for the, the obstacles that they have. And I intend to hold them accountable because, and it wasn't just Ocean State, but 
every district that was up for contract. They all agreed, and I'll restate it for the public. They all, every company agreed not to compete against each other. So every district that was up for a contract was stuck with whatever single provider bid on that on that on that contract, which is why 14 percent. It wasn't the best deal, it was the only deal, and that's what every other district is absorbing right now. So, um, yeah, I intend to make sure that we don't pay them any $1 more than, than they deliver us, regardless of relationships. At the end of the day, there was no relationship factored in when they saw an opportunity to, to bump us 14%. So, um, am I bitter about it? Yes. So we've got what, maybe by now, in my way off, if we said about $10,000, so not huge money, maybe less than that. That we owe that we get in credits. In credits. Well, you said, you said there were about four, four buses a, a week. Yeah, I'll say, I mean, I think that, I didn't look at it, and I, I'll go through it, but I didn't look at it from a standpoint of, the buses that they didn't use. I looked at it from the buses only if they didn't use a bus. So for example, if bus one was used for a parochial school that they couldn't provide transportation for for five days, then those would be the credits that I would get. Right. If you're asking me to look at the buses that were doubled up, I'd have to go back and look at that. No, no, it would be doubled up only because we're missing a bus. So, so you know, it's it's counting the bus that wasn't provided. Right. So right now there's only three there's only three days that a bus was not provided for students. We never we never left anybody in the lurch saying that we couldn't provide transportation. It was either a double run or it was a combined run that we provided. So all the kids were taken care of. It may not have been the best solution it may not have been as timely as everybody would have liked but no one was said i'm sorry today we can't transport you except for those three parochial school days and i have the same situation for a week from statewide for a davies bus that we didn't run yeah i understand our, our students got there um i guess and I'll, I'll let you work with craig right is just to know how many buses did we not have in service that we should have had, and what that equates to to date in So that's, that's what I'm asking. You. Yes, Chairman. yes. You yeah. want to know how many buses were not on a daily basis since September 2nd, how many were not being used because a driver called out sick? Whatever the reason, yeah, yes. No, whatever the reason. Yes, please. Okay. I sort of have an idea of what Okay. And so the chair, uh, part part of uh, my questions are about um, the delivery times have varied because of one reason or another. Yeah, and I would have to say that most of the concerning times that the kids got to school late um, were basically because of sub drivers and monitors. Usually, we don't have both uh, of the driving staff out on the same day. So if it's the driver, and then he can tell the, or he or she can tell the monitor what needs to be done. If the monitor is there and the driver is out, the monitor knows the route just as well. We've had some issues with the fact that both the driving staff was out. So that also happens on the return trip home at the end of the day. Yeah, by, by then they should know the run though. Well, I, I, I know there are some late deliveries at the end of the day, too, but... But there are some late deliveries due to the fact that, like I said, with the middle school running so tight, um, it trickles down. So if they get to the elementary school late, the kids get home a little bit later. Okay. Thanks, Diana. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to call your attention, Ms. Pushane. You asked about the openings that were in the district. It was under communication, if you saw that. 
Um, as of Friday, all teachers, um, we were full. As of Friday, as I mentioned earlier, then Monday morning, first thing, we got a resignation for math teacher at Riverside Middle School. So that's the only opening that we currently have for teachers at this point in time. With paraprofessionals, I think we're still short one para, oh no, I think Lisa interviewed today, Lisa Peter at Orlo and at Ken Heights, I believe they interviewed, they're not on here though, but I believe we filled those two positions. We still have two parapro openings at the high school though, and we have been unable to fill those positions when they find out the positions um, they're not interested in those positions. So we are going out, we're going to put on the boards in front of the schools, help wanted with the HR number, and we're going to take a big ad out, not a little ad, in the post, because we absolutely do not have any substitutes. It is critical. It is getting, I, I expect it'll get worse during the summer months, I mean winter months, excuse me, um, when the flu hits and colds hit, um, but it's critical throughout the state. I talk with my superintendents on a weekly basis, and it is critical, critical in all of the school systems. And I will tell you, I do worry about that. Um, we've even um, allowed parapros to start, and the condition that they'll either take their test, if the test is what's necessary, or take the course and you know, uh, validate that they have taken the course. It is, um, it is a critical shortage of employees. You saw it at Chatwells, you're gonna see it at the bus company, you see it in, in your schools, you're seeing it in restaurants all over the state. And um, so we're working as diligently as we can. The two human resource secretaries are looking up past substitutes and calling them to ask if they would be interested, whether it's teachers, paraprofessionals, uh, custodians, all right, secretaries, to see if they'd be interested in coming back. So they're actually making personal phone calls. There's, there's not much more that we can do. So when they're short, the principals are exchanging building-based paras or extra paras that they might have, they share them um, if they don't need them on that particular day and their staffing is good. So the elementary principals have been doing that together. The middle and high school have a little um, more leverage when it comes to coverages because of their schedules. So uh, that is in there now. Those are the openings that are left at this moment today. Could Superintendent Crowley, we go in. Uh, Superintendent Crowley, the, uh, I know this is just a snapshot. This is one week, but um, I, you have to notice the differences between the schools. For example, Olo Avenue, uh, Principal Peter must have had a great week because she had very few um, people out. Um, and again, Myron J. Francis seems to have had a great week because Riverside Middle School had many, many more people out. So I, I know this is just a snapshot from that one particular week, but is there a trend? Do you see a trend from school to school, week to week? No, it's very, it's very erratic, but what we're doing now that the quarter ended, I've asked for an attendance report, and with my new HR interim director, we're going to look to see if we can see any patterns in attendance abuse. We're looking at the patterns. So uh, we'll be looking at that and then we'll be contacting those people. Um, I think teachers and paras are burnt out in some instances and so they're taking more days than normal, Mr. Chonis. In some schools, I know White Neck, I will tell you, has consistently had a problem. Last Friday, I was afraid I wasn't even going to be able to open White Neck. Um, the principals have been going in to teach classes, um, and they have used their alternative teachers, such as art, music, et cetera, to fill in for classroom teachers as well in several of the schools. The principals are really working very hard. 
And again, we're not the only district in the state where this is happening. Through the chair. Um, so going forward, I think we need to be proactive instead of reactive because we are, we were, um, I didn't know this and shame on me for not knowing that the sub pay we had for paraprofessionals, that's shame on me. That's shame on this school, dish, this school committee to think that we are paying that low of, of price, especially when you are right, we are short in every restaurants, targets, grocery stores are starting at $18 an hour. You can go work at Aldi's for my husband for $18 an hour as a cashier. To think that these children are, they need somebody to be with them. For me to even hear the word, we are short two special ed paraprofessionals at the high school makes me cringe. Mm -hmm. um, and then in my opinion, that's when central administration needs to step up and they need to go. I, it bothers me more than you'll ever know to hear those two words. We don't have them for special education. Then we need to find them. So in other words, and you guys probably don't agree because I've tried to do this every time and I know that's a union issue. I'm, I'll, at this point, we need to find incentives to give these people to come to our district because we lost four paraprofessionals that started here in September to Bristol Warren because they paid more money. And they just had an uproar at their school committee meeting in last night. And so I can't sit here and look at nobody in here, but I'm sure at home, knowing that I understand the teacher shortage, I understand the paraprofessionals, and I also understand the fact that maybe they are burnout, and maybe we need to be proactive at that point instead of reactive. And maybe, you know what, do what most of the districts are doing in, the, in Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, and giving an extra day off. That's what they're doing. So that we don't burn them out and put them in a position where they don't want to come to work and they take a sick day and we're screwed. So that's what other districts are doing throughout the United States that are having the same problems as us. Probably not Rhode Island because that's what we don't do, but instead let's invest in the people that we do have and so they don't take off. So that's my opinion. I really think we need to start looking at that and trying to find a way that to balance ourselves. Um, we're looking at social emotional every day in the schools. I still want to see more. I, I, it will be my, re I didn't get, we got again another report that says, please make this brief so that we can get everything in that we need to. So I got nothing on the agenda. So I want to see what we're doing for social emotional, not just for our staff and our students, everybody, because we need something. We need something big. And that's what I'm asking. I, I apologize, but I don't apologize enough because I am also looking at the pre-K at Oldham. They have two teachers out for a whole week. One teacher, I'm sorry, and a paraprofessional. So there's going to come a breaking point that all these schools are going to be not be able to open. That's what's going to happen if we keep pushing and pushing instead of being proactive. So, well, that's I've, why we're asking you yeah. the, for the raises for the power of pros. Again, we have to remind you that there is a contract uh, for the power and pros we haven't had, and we certainly can't raise the daily rate for substitutes that would be higher than the power pro rate we have. Uh, I think that we've been as proactive as we possibly can. Um, they have, the power pros have 15 sick days, as do the teachers in their contract, and they have uh, three personal days in their contract that they can take. Um, and I think many of them, be, you know, if they are burnt out or... Uh, but if they take them all together, if they all take them together, if we take no, it as a um, district, any more it would be than, better. Um, I believe it's five days they have to get a doctor's note for anything longer. The personal days are not to be taken before or after vacation unless the superintendent approves it for a very serious situation, you know. Uh, something of that nature, which I haven't approved in a couple of years there. Um, but um, as I said, we're going to put the signs up in front of the schools. We're going to take a big ad, not a small help wanted ad, out in the post and, um, and go from there. And I'm hoping if you approve the raises that this will help um, us attract. Mm. I have a question. Uh, have you looked into it to doing uh, a job I'm ad? I'm having trouble hearing oh. Have you looked into doing a job ad in the ProJoy possibly? Because I, I mean, that has a bigger scope of, a, of an outreach. 
the I'm um, I'm getting the back. I <laughs> sorry. If you looked into putting a dog tag in the pro gel that has a wider Oh the pro gel. They actually include um, online we have we've gone school spring and indeed we've gone out to this um, site called indeed as well. Um, Projo, I'm not really sure it has a wider reading in East Providence. I think that your uh, post probably has a bigger reading in it. We can take out an ad in the journal. Yes, we certainly can. Yeah. And I think if we talk about raising it to $15, as Craig will tell you, that's pretty on the high end of what the substitute powers are getting throughout the state. It varies all over from 12 up. So I ask that we get that, that. Peep in writing this week. I'd like to see the substitute pay for all the school districts, if someone can get that. I had it last week for you, oh, uh, last month. For paraprofessionals? Power, he had the, yeah, he talked about that. Okay, well, we didn't do anything with Paris last okay, month. Right, I, I knew that. I just would yeah. like to see the data. Maybe you did send it to us. I apologize. No, okay. Thank you. I apologize. I was pretty sick at the last meeting, okay. so. That's okay. All right. And I, th I think it's worth revisiting. Um, I understand that there's contract in place. However, you know, if... If there's an opportunity to sit down with that union le leadership, whether it's a you know s signing bonus to be received after you know um, at the end of the the term, you know the the uh, school year, whatever it is, you know if 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 they're concerned with what the you know pay is, uh, there's got to be something. Um, that we've got to be willing to sit down and talk about, you know, because that's reopening. Oh. Okay. 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 So. All right. I am. My report is completed. I'm, I can't hear you. My report is completed. Oh. I'm. My report is completed. Okay. Thank you. Next item, please. Uh, Next item is the human resources report. Oh, she just, yeah, that's, yeah, we just did that. So now, director of finance, he kind of rolled right into Wait, human, resource. human resources. No, no, no we oh, we've been, <laughs> we've been talking about no. power pros and who left and who's coming in. I and... only referred that to communication where I put the report. No. <laughs> Nope. So um, here is the uh, personnel report from Human Resources. Uh, we had two resignations, Brian Lonergan, Human Resource Director, and Allison Gorbeo, paraprofessional, effective 10-22-2021, and Lonergan, effective 10-18-2021. Can I have a motion to approve? I'll approve as long as we get re uh, exit, re exit interviews on those two. Um, I I do have I I do have I do have the first one yes, and I, yep. I do know the second one too. Okay. So we have a motion by Miss Boshane to accept. I'll second. Second by Mr. Brandle. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? I have no, no recalls, no leaves of absence, no non-renewals, rescindments. James Foligno, math teacher, EP High School. I do know he was offered the job, why he didn't take it. He actually sent me a beautiful letter, and then we talked. We also he talked to me. He really did want it, but I, I can't go into it. It's personnel, but I do have it, Jessica. And Carolyn Plouffe, power professional at White Net. I also have that one for the principal. All right, appointments. Oh, can I have a motion to accept? I don't think, do, I mean, we don't do a motion for appointments. Do we have no, to do a I'm motion gonna, to rescind? But you, no, that's in the, 
Do you want me to announce them? You have to uh, make an amendment for rescindments, please. Okay. Motion by Ms. Boshane. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Ms. Ezenero. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> Okay, the following are the appointments. You don't have to vote on them. Just one, Sharon, oh. can you just make a note to, I want to get an opinion on that. It doesn't make sense that we don't vote for the appointment, but then we got to vote if they rescind their acceptance. Ooh. Like, I know, so I, I, think I just you don't do want to be going. Something. I think you did get something from. Well, I, I don't remember getting it in writing. Okay. So because, yeah, if we can. Yep. We send it out. We'll There'll be it. some logic to this. So. All right, Maura McElroy, paraprofessional white neck, Bethany Barron, paraprofessional white neck. They were short too, um, so they're full now. Casey Thomas, paraprofessional, Silver Spring. James Perry, math teacher, EP High School. Um, Michael Worth, math teacher, EP High School. Nicole Perkins, paraprofessional, Martin Middle School, pre-K. And her date is to be determined. Melanie Lane, social worker for the district. Jennifer Latane, paraprofessional Waddington. Leah Rose DeVargas, paraprofessional Waddington. And Miranda Giacovoni, special ed teacher, Hennessy, for the collaborative classes. No, that's the self contained um, special ed at Kent Heights. All right, and that's it for the human resource report for this evening. Thank you. Next item, please. Next item is Director of Finance Report by Craig Enos. Good evening, everyone. The budget report in front of you represents the end of fiscal year 2021 as of November 5th. As we end fiscal year 21, there is still revenue and expenses that have not come in yet and have yet to be re reported. So our final numbers at this point are still moving. So I'm not able to give a final number at this point. Probably, as I said, around uh, January, we will be able to. There are some items that I would like to point out to you in this financial report. In the 53,000 series, first three accounts, 53, 202, 203, and 204, speech therapists, occupational therapists, and psychologists. Why we normally do contract with private agencies for services, the overages in these line items reflect one, the increased need for these services during the year, but two, we also had to hire staff to cover caseloads for the staff people who were either out thick or on leave. So uh, they were still collecting their sick pay from up above in the 51,000 series, but we had to cover those students' uh, services. The other item that I just wanted to bring to your attention on page two, in the 55,000 series, accounts 55, 630, 640, and 650, of the usual accounts that I talked to you about, the out of district special education um, tuitions. Those amounts shown in the uh, fiscal year 2021 year to date expenditures um, are what we have encumbered during the fiscal year. As the purchase orders close out, those final numbers may change slightly, but overall we were on target pretty much for them for those accounts for the fiscal year. And a little bit down in account 55, 660 charter schools, you can see um, if you look at the year to date expenditures, fiscal year 2021 and then look at what we expended last year in fiscal year 2020, uh, you can see that there was a slight reduction in the, in the expenses um, compared to last. And finally, um, at the very bottom of the page, I uh, just want to talk about a couple items in the revenue. 
you can see that our final number for state aid increased over the budgeted amount. That increase reflects the increase to state aid that we received that happened on July 1st through October 31st. The next line down, tuition of the districts, that is the tuition that we received for the career and technical education center. The Medicaid revenue is slightly below the budgeted number at this time. There still may be other revenue that, that comes in, but I think that number is going to be, it will still be below a little bit of what we budgeted. Um, and then finally, just to point out um, the very last one in the other, um, a majority of that number represents insurance proceeds, approximately $174,000 um, from the insurance company when the old elevators at the high school flooded. Uh, the insurance company was obligated because those were deemed to be totally unusable. Uh, the insurance company was obligated to pay us off for that loss. So that revenue we have to put somewhere and that's where that is. Um, so that's all I have for this evening. Are there any questions? Craig, any, I know these, these aren't final, but you know, when you look at what you're, what you know is forecasted both revenue and expenditures, any concerns? None. No, um, we, we ended the year quite, quite well. Any questions? Thank you very much. Are you also speaking to ESSA or no? <laughs> I forgot. Sorry about that. Um, so tomorrow morning, um, Dr. Bowler and I have a Zoom meeting, a webinar that is a rollout for the ESSER 3 grant. Um, as the superintendent said, uh, so we have about 11.8 million that we will be receiving from ESSER 3 that we'll have to use by September 30th, 2024. We have done our rough development of what our goals are going to be and what the objectives are. Um, I'm just starting to assign some of the fiscal pieces to that, uh, but we will definitely be able to learn more tomorrow morning as we learn more from our colleagues at the Department of Education. Okay. Any questions? Quick, quick, quick question. Promise. Uh, I don't promise. Um, ESSER funding, going back to I know big projects, curriculum, all that stuff that I know we want to put money into and other things. It, are, we, are we using it for the smaller things like, I don't know, clubs and, and activities for kids? And, yeah, so, um, so and when, what's if, the process, if you don't mind me asking, for people to do this? So, they have, so, we, so part of the objectives that we looked at for the SN3 fund are definitely before school and after school activities. Field trips. Now you're speaking my language. Field, field trips, uh, transportation to go with those field trips to give the students experiences. All students. All students. All students. Yeah. All. All. Yeah. Not just no. summer school students or middle school students, all students have, all have the summer programs, the extended school year programs, supplies and, supplies and materials for the summer programs. I think in last month we did give you um, some highlights of the ESSER too. So it's for all students. It's paying for some after school activities for the special needs students. You know the artist that was at Eplock? We're running that I'm, program. So yes, it is. But that's for, not all students. So that's why I'm asking. All students. Like, all students. So like if, if a child can can't go to summer school because they had straight A's and they want to take a enrichment program or they want to do something that's above and beyond the academic school year we couldn't do that last year so what I'm asking is this year I'm asking all students so if yes. if 
you know, I, I've had this talk with Leslie, and I am so excited that Steve is, is doing an amazing job. Mm. But I'd love to bring that down to middle school students and give that opportunity, and, and elementary students, and not just one middle school, but two middle schools. Not just one elementary school at Myron, but let's do Waddington, like, and everything in between. Like, this money is for, in my opinion, <laughs> And, and what's documented, this is for stuff that we're dealing with hands-on right now, major problems. It is. There are six categories that you saw tonight with yep. that grant, and that's what we're dealing with, yes. And so there are lots of different after-school programs that are going on for all kids, field trip to enrichment programs. We have the money to pay for it, and I believe there's more in the $11.8 million that, of the ESSA grant that will be written. So all the principals had some say in that. I, I think we mentioned last week that um, I believe OLO wants to create an environmental classroom in a space that they have in the interior of their building, and I believe that Martin Middle School does too. You have to have the space to be able to do that. So we got suggestions from all of the principals. I think Riverside does a six-week cycle of some enrichment programs. I think he had cooking last year and things of that nature. Um, so yes, there are a lot of things that are going on, all for students in the schools. Okay, so you have to provide the curriculum. We, we're paying for our curriculum with that. And again, we asked the principals at the last meeting to come in, check those boards, and see if there's anything else they want to add to the boards before the grant is written. And then it has to be approved by a committee at the Rhode Island Department of Education. So you have to use it. And there's certain percentages for each one of those categories too that you have to use the money for. Do you want, to, do you want Greg to, I mean, Craig to talk about the, um, the raise in pays now while he's up there? Mr. Chairman? No, we, I mean... Call him back. No, we'll, we'll get to it. Okay. Yeah, so, but I will uh, I'll second what Ms. Boshane is saying. I think, you know, the, the question is the SEL impacts for all of our students you know, we, we tend to focus on pockets, but having, you know, if there are clubs, you know, interests, you know, the high school is talking about interests, but, you know, let's look at after school programs for the general population, you know, all those kinds of things I think we need to invest in. So I agree with you 100%. Absolutely. Uh, next item, please. Next item is the policy committee report by Jessica Beauchene. I'm just going to wait until we have a human resource director. It's, it's in my opinion, I, that's who I have been working closely with. Um, I didn't get to meet that last fella. Um, but uh, I know that Catherine and I had mentioned maybe, I don't know if, we're, if this, going forward, we may have to make some policies that, that we have no choice on. Um, I do want to just clarify that I am working on that dress code policy and I am getting um, opinions from the people that should be making the, mm -hmm. <laughs> the policy. Um, but other than that, I really would like to wait. I don't think it's anyone has to bear the grunt of sitting in three or four hour meetings once a week to, to come up with this. But there's really nothing on immediate that we need to worry about, I think. Next item, please. Next item is the building committee report by Joel Montero. All right. So I will, um, you guys all have the OPM report that the building committee received last night. Um, just very quick overview. Uh, first, the walkthroughs went amazing um, that we were able to, to host a couple weeks ago. Residents love it. Um, love the school are uh, more senior residents to me that's that's very telling that they uh, are very pleased with the investment that they made uh, they are making as taxpayers uh, for our students and those are those are the words that were repeated um, demo you notice the building is it's level uh, the only thing that's still remaining is the foundation for the uh, the old boiler room walls and it's anticipated to have a complete demo 
by the end of this month. Um, so we are ahead of schedule and doing well with that. Um, again, I'm not even really hitting the list. I'm telling you from uh, just just from from memory there. So you'll notice when you look, you, you have your your front landscape is filling in. You'll notice there's a foundation for the new clock tower, which sits on that elevated, uh, what will be the, the main entrance leading to the center of the building. On your right side will be your softball fields, the left side baseball fields, the uh, retaining wall and backdrops and fence posts and uh, light. Um, the bases for the, for the lights are going in. Um, yes, thank you, Ben, for pulling up the photos. Um, commissioning is ongoing uh, with the heating and the cooling. And right now, obviously, with the temperature dropping, they're, they're, they have an opportunity to really tweak uh, the heating now that that's starting to kick on, um, addressing, you know, they're, they're finding the, the, the kinks in the, in the um, CO2 thermostat readings and so forth like that. Uh, I will publicly note, because I really can't remember, it's a blur, but the the roof leak um, that was hitting the airwaves um, confirmed there is no roof leak. It was it's an air handling unit, a rooftop unit. Um, there's a uh, a spring component where it sits on the roof, and there's some flashing to it. And with the northeast driven rain, uh, there was a pinhole in the flashing. So they've uh, there's basically a patch on that to wait for the next two or three rain events to uh to to ensure that that's the the culprit and um it'll be permanently addressed but it's a rooftop unit uh, that was allowing water in uh, that's not the roof and i just want to put that to bed um what else i mentioned uh Yeah, you met you met Chris Murphy, so you get a taste for what he does. Oh, that's what I want to touch on. I'll, I'll leave with this. Um, we talked about maintenance um, and Chris Murphy's role with that. And Charlie, I know you had. I think you had asked him, you know, about how the, the needs of the building will change over the next few years, uh, which is spot on. And as a building committee, what we're looking at with the funds that are available is extended warranties and service contracts on those inti uh, intricate systems to protect the investment that the taxpayers have made um, you know so those are things that we are uh, we have requested those to be uh, to get estimates on so that we can consider them as a building committee um, to to do just that are there any questions from the committee Next item, please. Next is discussion items. So, first one is the naming request for John Sandy Gorham. Uh, you'll remember we had three members of the community step forward, one being uh, Mr. Teddy Gorham. Sandy's brother, and we talked about the naming. We have a conceptual design that was created by AI3, and I, um, all the members have seen that. Uh, that basically will be a um, basically a space to recognize all coaches um, and put it, put uh, in place under the, the name of Coach Sandy Gorham, um, as I believe is, if not the one of the most accomplished coaches that we've had the honor of having in East Providence. So um, any questions or comments on that item to discuss? It's up for first passage. Um, and the request will be that the committee um, 
vote on the creation and naming of a coach's recognition space to be named after Coach Sandy Gorham. Um, it would be first passage to create and agree to the naming. And then the second passage would include the final design for approval by the school committee and um, second passage for naming. So. Having no other comments or discussion, we did the chart wells. Next, I guess, Craig, you're up with the long-term substitute salary. So we're looking at the paraprofessionals and the substitute teachers. We didn't do the long-term substitute teachers last week in our discussion. So the paraprofessionals presently get $12 per hour. The proposed rate is $15 per hour, and I believe our first step paras are at $20 per hour. Is that correct, Craig? From um, what I understand? If, uh, if uh, they have a bachelor's. In the what? If they have a bachelor's. Okay. So you've got the three, three Long-term substitute teachers are paid $100 a day, and we're recommending $225 a day. We saw that in some of the districts around us that are paying that for long-term substitute teachers. And then we'd like to give retired EP teachers approximately $275 a day. We looked at the first step of our salary scale, and that's approximately what the daily rate of pay would be for those. When we talk about long-term substitute teachers, we have to include the permanent substitutes that are in the buildings as well. So that, that answers, I think, a question that I had asked Craig and we weren't sure on. So you're proposing... What would constitute as a long-term sub? A long-term sub would take the plate... Oops. A long-term sub would take the place of a FMLA, someone on... No, FMLA. no, no, not what they're doing. There, there, there was a time frame, right? We had a chart. Like if... if, if How many days? Like someone was out on jury duty and got picked is that a is that a two week that could be a two week span fmla could be a six month span um an yeah. injury that could, so, someone couldn't come yeah. back so I'm long term asking. substitutes is a long period of time it's not a daily sub in for jury duty jury duty is now only two days to begin with but it's not for short short so spans I, I it. it's for six weeks i would say and beyond when we talk about long-term substitutes that have to do some planning some testing uh, sometimes it's most of the year, to be honest. Sometimes it's half of the year for maternity and paternity leaves, things of that nature. But didn't so we're gonna go with six weeks. Yeah, what's 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 the what's the the identifier? What's the criteria? What's what's that what's that number of days that kicks it into it, a long term subcategory is the question. I thought we had that last it's usually at least um for example uh, the long-term substitute teachers would be for 13 weeks, let's say, of family medical leave. That's what a teacher is entitled to. FMLA is a maximum of 13 weeks. That would be a long-term substitute teacher who would be responsible for going into the classroom and actually teaching. It could be, you know, as I said, a maternity leave that usually goes into an FMLA leave. Um, after their six weeks maternity leave. Um, an illness, a long-term illness, someone is out for treatment for a long period of time. It could be several months. That's so, what we determine long-term when they're also going to be responsible for developing and following lesson plans, testing the students, and have all the responsibilities as opposed to a daily sub. So. The question is, there's got to be a time frame. In other words, if it's X amount of days or more, you're a long-term sub. And that's the question. It's not like right now, every, what you're saying, well, if it's this example, that example. The question is, if I'm subbing for you know, 89 days and I'm just grabbing a number out of the air, and all of a sudden I hit the 90th day, now all of a sudden I fall into the long-term subcategory. Is that what's being asked? Because there's gotta be, we have to be able to, to, to forecast that 
uh, you know, I mean, how do you how do you budget for that to know? Okay, well, well, this person jumped into ninety, but uh, it wasn't this cause. Of, it's going to be number of days. I don't really care about the well, cause. You can set that. There's no days in um, HR right now for long. I can't. What, what did you say? There's no um, number of date. There's no number of days for HR in HR right now as long-term subs. There is no criteria that we that they use right now. I looked at that. So do you want to set six weeks and above? Do you want to set thirteen weeks and above, which is the FMLA that they're so, entitled? So you t so you're telling me that other districts pay long-term subs a higher rate, but we don't know at what point they qualify for that higher rate? I do, from being one, and they, used to, they used to pull you. They used to pull you before you reached that date. So a lot of districts did this back in the night, late, you know, back then, and they would pull you before you got to that point so that you didn't make that pay, just well, like they pull you before first step. someone they, substitutes 135 days consecutively, yep. They're on step one. And that could be anywhere in the district, okay? It doesn't have to be in one position. If they make 135 days, they go into step one. Which is how much per day? Okay. Would be the daily rate of pay for step one. They'd be on step one, which is 40 some thousand. What is the step, step one? one? $254 per day. That's step one plus a master's. Okay, so that's at 135 days, right? Mm -hmm. Is that is that what I heard? State, yeah. So at what, how many days do I have to be subbing in order to get $225 a day? Again, there's no established number in East Providence. Okay, well, I, I mean, unless I, I so, again, I could be missing something, but I thought we were looking to, 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 to be consistent and competitive with other districts. So if, if you're telling me that the state of Rhode Island has a, you know, operates in a manner that they just determine arbitrarily what sub they're going to consider long term and short term that to me doesn't seem like anything close to fiscally responsible. Yeah. How, how are we voting on a long-term sub rate if we don't know how many days qualifies you as a long-term sub? Ride only comments on the 135 days for step one. They do not determine the long-term sub status of a district. It would be up to the district what they consider a long-term sub. So, so what is the district asking the school committee to identify as a long-term sub before we even talk about what the rate for that sub will be? I think I probably that? six weeks. Well, I, yeah, but I, respectfully, I don't, want, I don't want probably. I want, this is, a, well, the issue I have right now is what I feel like we should have in front of us is Here's the average number of days that, that we have vacancies or we have subs working. So if we move to this day at 225 is the daily rate, fiscally, here's the fiscal impact to that, to making this increase. This is how, like. So speaking on myself, I would say six weeks would be an incentive for anybody to take the 225 and to come to our district, in my opinion. If you're gonna offer me six weeks, if I can, if you start at six weeks and it could be for the rest of the year, I think that's an incentive to get people to long-term sub here. What another incentive is, is to hire them afterwards. Just saying, I think we, that's when I got on the school committee, that was the problem. We weren't hiring our subs back in the day. Now I think it's a part, it's just should be what you do. Um, if they're good enough, then they should be hired. And so I think that when a position becomes available, which seems to happen, um, I think six weeks is, is, is good. So, Joel, I'm not HR, but I believe that they start at $85 a day, correct? That's the starting pay for a substitute teacher. We just that 
200. We just moved it to 100, right. But it was 85, and after so many days... And on the 30, 31st day... On the 31st day, so they would... They would go up to 150. That's what exists. On the 31st day, they go from 100 to 150. Is that retroactive to the first day, or it kicks in at day 150? Just so we just start counting on, on that first day. Uh, uh, you just... So if I, so I, if I started... Uh, substitute teaching, and the first job I did was on, on October 1. But maybe during October, I only worked 10 days. And then, in, but I worked a full November, a full December, and a full January. Well, by, by December, I'm going to make my, my 31st day. So on that day 31 that I substitute, my rate will go from 100 to 150. So the question that I asked is, is it retroactive to day one, or does your pay change on day 31? Pay changes on day 31. Okay, and then the other piece, because the example that you gave, and forgive me, I, I missed, are you telling me that it's cumulative or it has to be a straight run? Cumulative. Cumulative, okay. So, that, so we have, so we have a, a, a pay scale break at day 31 that gets you from 100 to, how much was it? 150. To 150. So after day 31, what are we proposing gets, at what day do you go to 225? So the next step, after, after day, when you get to day 61, then your pay goes from 150 to 175. Okay, so 175 at day 61. And then it, it stays the same. All right, so, so currently we are at day 61, you're at 175. Correct. So then the question I still have is on what day number would I go to 225 on this proposal? You'd have to be in for the same teacher. You'd have to be in for the same person. What he's talking about is they would you would be like art one day, music one day, Correct. science another day. You'd be at Martin Middle School, then Riverside. This, a long term, is in the same position. Bro. Long term also, as in like if someone is out, for like you know, for you know, family or medical leave, they are in charge for like the next six to thirteen weeks to have a full out lesson plan, testing, and all that. It is a different workload than someone that's hopping from classroom to classroom in different subjects, right? Am I, am I grasping that? Correct. The, the difference of, of pay and workload? Right. Okay. A long-term sub would be a person we hire to take up the role of a teacher that was on leave, whether it be a maternity, paternity, um, FMLA leave, personal leave, long-term sick leave, that would be what the 275 was, the same job. So, but don't we have, don't we have situations where, where it rolls into one unexpectedly or in other words, it starts out and so that's, I mean, there's gotta be some, some, and it became retroactive. That, I said back in the old days. I didn't say now. Just you know what I mean? Know. Like this, you know, if if a if a teacher is out and it turns into an FMLA unexpectedly because, God forbid, you know, right. like a right. di so now that teacher now becomes a long term but didn't start out. So is it? So yeah, one will it then become retroactive. Uh, now really muddy the waters. Do you then say, you know what, we're Same gonna job. hire somebody like it, maybe that's not the person for a long term sub. I don't I don't know. All it, right. Whatever it takes to get if it were the same job, Joel. If it were the same job. And I and you know, I'm sure I'm not in the HR department. I don't usually I don't see any of the reports from ASOP that come out. But last week I did happen I just happened to, to see one. 
and they're someone who's a, who they're called a long-term sub. And so they've been in since the beginning of the school year. They're going to be in for, I think, 66 days, one, and one, one shot for that one uh, teacher. Then there's, it, looks, it looked like that teacher was coming back for a period of time, and then that person was going out again. So that same person that was in for the 66 days is coming back again for like another, I think like another 20, say. So that particular person would be considered a long-term sub. It'd also be considered the best thing you could do because that's consistent for the child. Correct. So that's Correct. kind of what we're trying to get at. Consistency and people that would like to continue to stay in our district. And we don't... We don't know what what this could potentially equate to in dollars, and I'm not saying it shouldn't be done, but like do we have any kind of like if if we had done this last fiscal year, how many of these yeah, I, I don't know how many okay all right that's a, long -term oh. yeah, that the was, last that the, differs from year to year, Joel, quite a bit okay, the last question I have is how does this where does this put your building based subs? How does it compare? The building based sub is in the building every single day. They're guaranteed to come in whether there's a shortage or not. So if there is a shortage of um, a teacher, that's the first person they use. Yeah, no, I know how they're used. Okay. I'm asking how they're compensated. $100 a day. Huh? One hundred dollars a day, guaranteed one hundred and eighty days of work. But we're not upping their pay. Not what? Are you? we upping their pay too? No, building base subs. Are you? Pardon me. I see. I could talk loud. I just wasn't. Yes, I would think that if you're going to, um, yes, increase the long-term substitute teachers, that you would increase the building-based sub. Now, right now we have two in each one of the elementary schools because we knew we expected a problem, a shortage, and we still with those in the building, so yes. Would we be going as high as the long-term sub because they wouldn't be doing the same work as a long-term sub? They unless they get put in the long-term sub position? That would be based on this principle, I'm assuming? Well, right now we're asking for the 225 uh, from the school committee because we've had difficulty getting people to commit to that in the buildings. We were short Ken Heights until I think we just got one, at Ken, a second one at Ken Heights. The principals advertise and they make the recommendation. So the chair. Yeah, please. Yeah, well, uh, looking at this very brief memo, um, it is, I, I can see where you would have questions um, defining um, what the, what the uh, titles of, of the positions are. And, and also looking through the snapshot that the superintendent provided us of uh, a week or so ago with the number of absences throughout the district, um, we have lots of people out. I mean, I, it, it, I don't think that's a, a question um, because those are, the, those are the numbers that are in front of us. So we have many people out who may not fall into the category of long-term substitute teacher, okay? So my, clear, my, my question is, most of the people, are, we're still talking about $100 a day, unless they are a long-term substitute teacher. So I, I thought we were going to try to move the substitute pay across the board, not just for long-term subs, but for others too. Is that not what we're... We want to do. I notice we're doing it for the paraprofessionals, but we're not really clear on what what the substitute pay is, Joel. Probably I think that's that last, that's still a question. You did that last month. You approved we, that last month. We did that. 
for teachers. We didn't touch para pros last month. Okay, but this is still about teachers. This is still about yes, long term teachers. We, we never touched teachers. long term teachers last month. We, we touched the day to day subs last month. Okay. I, 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 I don't think we did enough last month to be aggressive and find substitute teachers, okay? So maybe I'm looking at this sheet of paper with three lines on it, and this is not the silver bullet either, okay? Uh, so I can see the frustration that we're feeling, but I think there's an urgency to do something. There's an urgency because, you know, all we have to do is look at the reports that we got from the administration. We're missing a lot of people. And to include a human resources director, okay, which is might be why we're kind of in this position right now, beating ourselves up about the... Uh, the dollars. I, I, I just, I want to do something, but I don't know if we have the information to do what we want to do. Thank you. No, I, and I agree. Um, Charlie, that's why I'm frustrated because this is important and this gives me nothing. I have no comparative, no nothing, and, and we're just basically throwing like i don't know it's just like general understandings and one of the things that you mentioned right great point so we're focusing now on long-term subs is that in fact where our gap is or is that or is it in the day-to-day -day absences that we can't fill if it's a day-to-day -day stuff then that i agree like that should be the priority I understand we increased that last time from 85 to 100. We did that without really, I don't really recall seeing where that put us district-wise. I think maybe we had something to look at, but is that like... I, I think we should do more. I think we should do more than what we did last month, and I, and I think we should step this up too. So I, I, I just don't... I want to do something aggressive. I want to do something... But I want to do it the right way. I want to do it according to the law and uh, according to what uh, the best offer that we can make to uh, the potential workforce out there. So you approved the day-to-day -day subs last year, for, uh, last month, and we showed you some districts that were comparable. Um, we did raise it for, to 150 and then 175 on the days. So we took care of the day-to-day. Uh, Mr. Chonis, and I think I sent it to you during the month to show you that. Do you want to hold off on long-term substitutes until we get you some more information and retired teachers? That's fine. But I really like to have you uh, approve the increase in the paraprofessionals um, because we do have a problem with paraprofessionals who's went to, who are going to other districts because they are paying more. The average is what we have, which is $12. Some districts have 12 Some districts, um, jo uh, what did you look at last week, Craig? He's looking it up now. Some are 15 some are 20 But um, if you could just, the daily substitute uh, increase for the paraprofessionals, we did not take into consideration last month. Through the chair, I'd be willing to, to go along with uh, the superintendent, and, and since that's what we have on the agenda, that's kind of what we're limited to. Yeah. Let's, let's do that, but let's also look, let's get to do a deeper dive in this, because when I look at this sheet about unfilled absences from week of 1025 to 1029, this is unbelievable. You know, how do you run a school system like this? And, and without being aggressive, and I think, uh, and many of us have said it, if we're not going to be aggressive, then, then this will only get worse. Because, oh, by the way, people aren't going into education like they used to. All right? People are not becoming school teachers like they w were 5, 10, 15 years ago. So this problem is only going to get worse. And if we don't take the bull by the horns, and I, again, I will say, without a full-time human resource director, that puts 
a real crimp in our style, okay? Someone who's very familiar with the laws of the state and, and what we can do and what we can't do. And, uh, you know, I just, I just think we need to address this. I'm willing to go along with this for tonight, but I think this is an ongoing conversation. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, so one, if, if we could, we can't just throw, you got three line items. You go from power pro to long-term subs to retired teachers, and we literally had them presented to us all at once, which to me makes absolutely no sense. Right? I mean, you've got to say, okay, first item, power pros. This is what we're looking at. This is where we'd like to go. This is why. And, you know, this is the cost. I mean, let's do one at a time. We bounce all around, and then there's absolutely no data. So I agree. You know, power pros, that's the, the rates that are being thrown at us should be in front of us as part of this presentation. So it's that, well, you know, I mean, my math is not great, but I mean, you're talking between 500 to a million dollars additional. Um, just in, if I'm right, just in building current building long building base subs. And so I, I quickly I didn't know how many. Yeah, right. If there's two per yeah, if there's two so, per elementary school. So I just did it quick and just just on the salary alone without the payroll taxes pieces of it, it's an, it's an additional three hundred sixty thousand dollars just for the building base. So I do. I definitely agree. Even though I do believe we need them, and I, I am willing to figure out where we're going to go with that. Um, the difference between a long-term substitute teacher and a building base, I think, fluctuates. But I'd love to hear everyone else's opinion on it. This probably may not be the night, but um, I would hope that any building base would get the opportunity to do a long term in the in the classroom because that's pretty much why they're there. So I would hope that they got that opportunity. Then you bring in someone else to be the building base at a certain price. Um, I think paraprofessionals, we don't even have them for a long term. So it looks like, to my knowledge, you know, the two at the high school, if maybe if those people, you know, after all said and done, and we're looking at subs, and I know this is a union thing, and we'll have to talk to the union, but maybe we need to look at that too. So we get substitute for paraprofessionals as well, you know, for a long term basis, if that seems to be what we need, which I think it is. Um, but I'm also on board with this. I think we need to work on this one and get this up really fast. Jessica, the paraprofessionals, we always did have subs for them. Unfortunately, this year, any sub we had, we hired. Okay? And we don't have any because we're still trying to hire. So it's not like we're not putting a sub in. We just right. don't have it. So Well, maybe if we agree to this and it gets out in the public, we'll start to see more. Yeah, I hope so. So... So you've got the, the power increase, which sounds like a no-brainer. On the long-term sub, there's a lot of questions that are coming, and, you know, and I understand saying we don't have an HR di director, we don't, but we have a report that shows openings, and your principals can tell you, or Definitely principals can, can tell you that's a long term, this is not. Like that, that's basic data where we're looking, we just spent 40 minutes talking about the fiscal impact or trying to find out the fiscal impact on a long term sub. And I don't know if that's the need that we need to, to address. Are we really missing it on the short term? And that's where we need to increase. You know, so. Like, we'll get that information for you for the next meeting, Joe. We'll let you know how many long-term positions, what, what we consider long, what they consider long-term positions um, right now. And, I, and then um, we'll get some other districts that have that in the number of days they consider a long-term position for you from other districts. And um, the retired EP teacher, you want to hold on that as well. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. real brief, because I think that needs more discussion, I'll tell you that right off the bat, I think to just automatically give any retired teacher a significant amount of money over another <laughs> sub without, you know, I mean, that's making quite the expensive assumption that just because they're a retired teacher that they're going to be, you know, no offense to retired teachers, but to assume that they're going to be, you know, 
bring in more value than someone who didn't retire from the district or a younger teacher coming in. Um, I mean, we could have a, I'd rather see it where it's a proven sub and at the discretion of, you know, the, whether it's a principal or someone where they're, they're saying, I need this person because I know what they can do and have some discretion there as opposed to just first come first serve to someone who just happens to be retired. To the chair, I, I, I understand your point, but uh, there's a saying, beggars can't be choosers. And, and looking at this snapshot from the week of 1025 to 1029, where we might just fall in a category of being beggars, looking for the number of teachers and the number of paraprofessionals, but as, even teachers. We're, we're short on a lot of substitute teachers. So I mean I don't I don't I wouldn't want to be too shy on the dollar amount. No, I'm not okay. shy on the dollar amount. I'm just saying there needs to be discretion. In other words, it, like I may be a retired teacher, and the district may be happy that I retired, and you being a retired teacher and you're very good at what you do, I would rather the the principal be able to say, Charlie, can you come in today and here's your higher rate because I need you and not for me to be like, hey, I'm retired, pay me, and not be effective. That's what I'm saying is give the discretion, the, the option being there so that they can be competitive and aggressive, but not just wholeheartedly just throwing it out there. So and, I and I understand that. I just, when I see something with uh, Mr. Enos's name on it, uh, then I have to think that Mr. Enos has done some uh, investigation on the dollar amount, and I would have faith in the dollar amount that he puts in front of us. I mean, I, I know that it looks uh, almost like preferential treatment or, you know, like we, we don't care. Uh, whoever it is, whoever you are, come on in and we'll pay you this. But, I mean, I, I think we're almost to that point where we are that. So my question desperate. is, is the 275 for EP retired teachers, is that a day or is that if they are a long-term sub? And if so... Do we have criteria now, currently? Do we pay our East Providence retired teachers differently? No, actually, some of them leave because other districts pay higher for a daily rate of subs. So they, we, some other districts pay 275 a day to sub. Yes, I believe um, uh, for, re, for, e, uh, for their own teachers, I believe Barrington plays 275. That was on our list last week, wasn't it? For long-term subs. No, that's no, what I'm not asking long -term. You. I'm asking, is it a retired East Providence teacher? It just says proposed. So this is right. where I'm getting confused. Is that a day no matter what? Yes. yes. So they come to school on Tuesday. They are music. They get 275. They come tomorrow. They're art. They're 275. That's what Providence and Pawtucket do, by the way. I know those two cities do that, that same amount. It's 275. 250 and 225. And that's not a long term. That's not a long term. And we pay our regular subs... How much? A hundred. One hundred dollars. Right. Hello. That's what I've been saying too. That's why we voted on it in the last meeting. It's got to be addressed. No, I mean that's a huge difference between a retired teacher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And an, and a and which I'm sure has given everything, and I'm not knocking that, but and a a, a teacher who's five years out trying to become a teacher. It's interesting. But, I didn't know that. I never knew that. We Charlie, had a you're, you're saying those districts pay the sub regardless of them being a, a retiree. Yes, and and I think superintendent, yes. you all put those numbers in front of us in the last meeting. The last meeting. And yeah. and because I know you left because you were sick at the last meeting. I have, I have the numbers. Okay. I didn't know that I had EP numbers. And I, I think Cranston. Was no, we just, we just saw the EP retired numbers today. But the Pawtucket numbers, the Providence numbers, the superintendent gave us those numbers a month ago. Okay. Right. I'm more concerned about the difference between our East Providence retired teachers and our regular teachers. That's where I'm confused. You know what? I, I think, like I said, beggars can't be choosers, and I think we have to, to decide that we have to be aggressive and we have to make some moves. No, these are just different times. Teachers were very competitive. They wanted to sub because they knew there were jobs available. Unfortunately, over the last few years, there haven't been jobs for every sub that you used. Um, and uh, what's happening now 
is substitutes have the pick of the litter, so to speak, where they go. It, it's just such different times. But we can come back with more information on the last two if you would like um, for next month, absolutely. We'll get a list of as many districts as we can and what they consider a long-term substitute and if they pay anybody retired from their district any more uh, than the daily rate of pay of a sub. We'll get you that information. Okay. If you want, is that what you'd like? Yeah. All yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's what we'll do. Yeah, we've got to know okay. where the need is. We've got to, you know, uh, uh, know that list that we have of vacancies is what I'm saying. We're, we're spending so much time talking about long term, and I'm not so convinced that it's long term openings. It's just repeated short term openings, and if we dump all our money into long-term openings, we'll, we'll never spend, we'll rarely spend it, but it's, it will never, we'll, we won't fill the positions that we need to fill on a day-to-day -day because yep. that's where we're short. So I'd rather invest where the impact is. So we'll, do, we'll find out exactly the breakdown in several districts, as many as we can. All right. I think we hit long-term teacher subs, para pro subs. The last discussion is real brief. The resolution basically it's to extend Rhode Island General Law 16-7-40 C and D, which gave the incremental um, percentage reimbursements on the housing aid, and um, districts across the state are are considering this resolution. Um, and or passing it and it basically is asking the General Assembly to extend the time frame since COVID delayed a lot of construction and with districts having an opportunity to, to capitalize on um, the, the bonus reimbursement. I can read it verbatim but I think I pretty much laid it out. That's what that resolution would do. It would ask them to, to extend it. Next item. Next item is action items. First one, consider a vote to approve the bill list. I'll move that we vote to approve the bill list. Thank you, sir. Motion by, by Mr. Chonis. Do I have a second? I'll second. Second by Mr. Brandle. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Next is considering vote to approve the naming request for John Sandy Gorham. The uh, motion that I would entertain would be uh, a motion for the creation and naming of a coach's recognition space, uh, which will be named after Coach John Sandy Gorham. This would be, that would be the motion. And as I said earlier, this would be the first passage. Second passage, second consideration and passage would also include the school committee uh, approving the actual design. That's that's a long one. I, I move to <laughs> approve that motion <laughs> by <laughs> and and as first passage. Yeah. So so the motion is the motion is for the creation and naming of a coach's re recognition space to be named after Coach John Sandy Gorham. That's the, the motion. And then on record is to state that the second passage will also, on that agenda, will be the final design uh, to be approved by the school committee. So I'm sorry. So we had a motion by Mr. Uh, Mr. Chonis. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Ms. Azanero. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. All right. So I will entertain a motion to table item three uh, the long-term substitute salary well actually well let me let me take that back i'll understand a motion of whatever okay, so the committee I a motion to table that as long as, oh, sorry. 
long as we make sure that it's on the December meeting. Because I'd like to make sure this is taken care of mm -hmm. ASAP. So, so as soon as possible, I'll table it until the next meeting. So until we have all the documents we want. Motion by Ms. Boshane to table this for it to be revisited in the December on the December docket. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Ms. Sazanero. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Item five through twelve. Excuse me, I'm out. Mr. Lucia, did, did you skip item four? Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I did. Thank you. Item four: Consider and vote to approve power professional substitute salary. How did I skip that? Oh, that's pretty bad. <laughs> Move to approve. <laughs> Motion by Mr. Jonas. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Ms. Azanero. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? After all that talk, right? That would have been. No, I wouldn't have thought that. Yeah. Okay. So items 5 through 12 are uh, construction project related, vetted, and approved by the building committee. We have uh, invoices for AI3. Peregrine, Gilbane, Stephen Turner, Thoush Construction, uh, invoices from the high school to the city, uh, invoices for fixtures, uh, furniture, fixtures, and equipment, and invoices for utilities. Craig, if you could just, just do the, all of them, list all of them, and then we'll, we'll entertain one motion. Do you want me to just want the grand total? Do you want me to read it? You read each one, please. Which one? You got it. Uh, so construction invoices for payment, AI3 basic services, $29,484.68. AI3 extra services, $7,419.50. Gilbane Building Company, $2,810,053.07. Peregrine Group LLC, 59000 Stephen Turner, Inc., $14,134.50. Build Engineering, $6,560. For a total of $2,926,651.75. Furniture, fixtures, and equipment invoices for payment. Inc. $143,400. Avery Piano $20,500. Carolina Biological $1,505. Dell Inc. $12,000. Jerry's Music Shop $3,594.60. Gov Connection $28,616.60. Kidridge $12,491.79. Luca Music, $7,999. NextGen, $4,439.14. Portland Pottery, $13,090.12. RCD Holdings, $22,105.70. Rogers Athletics, $3,345. Sergeant Welch, $60,057.40. School Health, $214.03. School Specialty, $1,520.65. Something uh, Fishy, $63,196.99. Sports Imports, $654. Stage Right, $35,130. Wally Computer Associates, $5,299.20. And William B. McGill Company, $459. For a total of $439,618.22. And then reimbursements. Uh, these are all um, monies that are owed back to the school department that were budgeted as part of the building project. So the first line being the water and sewer for the, when the new water line was installed before we took ownership of the building on August 31. So that's for 
and 67 cents. The new electric meters that were installed, uh, lot of lots of bills all came in one clump. Again, all before we took ownership of the new building, $48,896.99. Um, one equipment item that was left off the equipment list was the microwaves for the staff lounges and the offices. So we went to SW Appliance and we bought those. Um, so that was $1,349.91. And then finally, there were some um, science equipment that was just easier for us to order and to get reimbursed for. So we did that with, uh, for Flynn Scientific for $4,548.57 for a total of reimbursement to the East Providence School Department of $83,363.14. That Thank include you. item 12? Yes. Um, move to approve items 5 through 12. Motion by Mr. Chonis to approve item 5 through 12. Do I have a second? I'll second. Second by Mr. Brandel. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item 13, consider vote to approve the creation of an additional position in the custodial union. So moved. Motion by Mr. Chonis. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Ms. Azanero. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Carries. 14, consider a vote to approve the resolution on the change to Rhode Island General Law 16-7-40 C and D. So moved. Motion by Mr. Chonis. Do we have a second? I'll second. Second by Mr. Brando. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Carries. Uh, Craig, I think you've got to come up. Uh, consider a vote to approve the purchase of two vans and one trailer for the CTC. We've been up here lots of night. Um, yes, so before you is a memorandum uh, that Bob Hanlon and I wrote. So with, uh, with uh, funding that we got from the Department of Education, we are asking to proceed forward with the purchase of two vans and a, and a trailer. One van will be for the construction program, and the other van with the accompanying trailer will be for the culinary arts program that we have that will allow the students when they're going, uh, that they can go out and do catering events, that we can, one, transport the students in the van, and two, with the trailer that we have, we can load up all of the food and everything that they, that, um, that they need to carry. Uh, we, uh, we, we looked at pricing through the Mass Combines and the Massachusetts Higher Ed Consortium, where we have always gone to uh, for, for pricing for vehicles. Uh, if you remember last month, you approved the purchase of two trucks from MHQ. Uh, so we went back to MHQ um, and they provided us pricing for the two vans and as well as the trailer. Um, both item, uh, the two vans and the trailer, we placed the order. We give them purchase order tomorrow. We're probably looking at a May, June delivery. Um, for for those, which would be perfect timing because we have to use the grant funding by June 30th. Now that's Perkins, right? Perkins. Yeah, Perkins. Move to approve. Second. So motion by Mr. Chonis, second by Ms. Azanero. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Um, I'll be honest with you, I'm not really sure what this last item is. The last item um, is in your uh, packet. It is the resignation of the uh, social worker and the agreement that goes along with that resignation. I have a motion. I'll move to approve. A motion by Mr. Toners. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Ms. Adenero. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. 
I know I saw that there's no public comment. Are there any announcements? I believe Dr. Ferran ran off the copy of the MOU for you. Oh, well, yeah. I'm sorry. I believe Dr. Ferran ran off a copy of the MOU for you tonight, so you could take it home and uh, look at it. Any other announcements? Just happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Likewise. Likewise. Yes, happy holidays. Happy Veterans Day, Charlie. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, else. sir. Right. There is no school on Thursday. And I believe there's a Veterans Day celebration, Mr. Chonis, at Veterans Memorial Parkway, sponsored by the city. Am I correct? Yes, there is. Yes. Uh, 11 a.m., right? 11 a.m. Yeah, that's. Mm -hmm. uh, that can be a tough time of day for me, but I'll, uh, if I can make it, I will. But thank you. It's a wonderful, I think we, uh, all, all veterans um, should be remembered and, and recognized. Thanks. Always, right? Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Motion. I'm a motion to adjourn. Motion uh, to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Azanero, motion to have a second. Second right. by Ms. Bochain. All in favor, signify by saying aye. We got to go. Aye. 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 Any opposed? What a night. Thanks, folks. Thank you, Ben, Alfred. Appreciate you. Peter.